Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if god like Naruto is death god in high school DxD. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Hiskinjist and link in the description and support writer. Let's start the video. Chapter 1, Failure Makes Us Who We Are, It has been such a long time since he became a genin, hasn't it? Four years to be exact. Such a long time, and so many experiences came along with the many journeys he and his team had. He still remembered Haku. He was special to him. In a way, he could say that Haku was his first friend that understood him, who had lived a similar life to his. Who had experienced the same pain as him. To him, that small moment he had spent with the other boy in the forest had been one of the best moments in his life. That was also when he had found a new goal. To protect his precious people. Precious people. He was a boy who had no one in the beginning. But slowly with all his capabilities, he had filled his void heart, his void world with friends and people he could trust with his life. People he would gladly give his life for. Everything used to be so simple back then, did not it? Wake up in the morning, eat a simple breakfast, go to the team meeting, take a mission and whine if a nice mission was not sent their way, complete said mission, train a little, come back home, eat dinner and sleep and dream of one day becoming Hokage. That was the routine back then. To his simple and naive mind, that was how his reality was. But it changed. Everything changed. His reality was slowly shattered. He and his team were given the opportunity to participate in the Chunin exams. And things just went downhill from there. Everything went downhill from there. Orochimaru had ambushed them in the forest of death and had given that damned curse mark to Sasuke. Now that he thought about it, that was the moment when his world was turned upside down, did not it? No, that was the beginning point. He was glad that he had met Pervy Sage soon after the forest of death. He did not know what he would have done without that pervert of a sage. He had found a guide, a mentor and in many ways a father figure in his life. Thanks to his teachings, he was able to defeat the Hyuga prodigy, Niji and avenge Hinata. And then, his fight with Gara, A boy who was just like him. Both of them had been cursed at their birth and by their own fathers. Now that he thought about it, if anyone in this world came even close to understanding him, it would have to be Gara. But while he took the path of righteousness, Gara had taken the path of a murderer. That fight had been epic. Ara had called forth the full power of the One Tails, and he had called upon the chief Toad Gamabunta. That fight was memorable, and he had won. But his joy in winning the fight never came. Because the old man had departed the plane of the living. Died at the hands of the very student who he adored the most. Such a cruel way to die. He wondered what it would have felt like for the old man to see the boy he had raised with his own arms turn into a monster that would try to destroy his village. But alas, he would never know. Then he met Granny Tsunade. She was a prudent drunkard, and still is. He seriously hated the lady at first when she had proclaimed all Hokages to be idiots and degraded his dream. But after the fight with Kabuto, she changed. The next day, when they were returning, she had proclaimed that she believed in him and had given him one of the most precious necklaces in the world. But then, the situation degraded quite fast. Something happened to Sasuke. He challenged him at the hospital, leading to them fighting. For him, it was just a challenge between two rivals. But he was shocked when Sasuke had suddenly charged up his Shidori. That was the first sign when he had realized Sasuke was changing. And soon after, Sasuke defected the village. He had chased after him meeting him at the Valley of End. He had thought that maybe he could convince Sasuke from making a terrible mistake, from joining Orochimaru, from turning rogue. But it was all for naught. Everything he had tried had been thrown back at him with thrice intensity. He should have realized that this Sasuke was not the same Sasuke who he thought of as a rival, a friend or brother. They had fought vehemently and done some impressive destruction of the landscape for two genins. But in the end, he had lost. Failed to prove himself once again. Failed to stop his friend from leaving, failed to show his brother he still cared. Failed once again just like all the time he had failed before. And then he met Sakura, and his guilt only increased. Seeing the girl you love the most cry for the heart of another was painful. But that day, when he laid on his bed injured, staring at her face that was riddled with tears, as she cried for Sasuke, broke his heart. It was that time that he realized that no matter what he did, he could not be the object of her love. That brought tears in his eyes and for the first time in his short life, Naruto Uzumaki gave up on something. But he remained brave. He did not let her see his heart falter and break, instead he smiled at her brightly and promised her to bring her love back to her. And then, Jurei offered him training and if Naruto had anything to say, he would clearly say that those two and a half years he spent with Jureya were the best years in his life. He had learned all sorts of things, seen lots of things, interacted with a lot of people. And became a lot stronger. He promised himself to never fail again. He promised himself to be strong. When he had returned to the village, everyone had been shocked that the loud mid midget had all grown up and matured. Frankly speaking, it was thanks to Jureya that the maturity even came along. 
Some nights he would just spend chatting with the sage, and the latter would fill him with different types of wisdom that Naruto took to heart. Huh, he never realized when he had stopped calling Jiraiya, pervy sage. He was the person he looked up to as an uncle-grandfather-father figure for a large part of his life, and then he had gone and sacrificed himself for information. A childish part of Naruto wanted to blame Jiraiya that he should have never gone there without backup, but the matured part agreed with his actions. If he had been in his place, he would have done the same thing. And again, it was thanks to Jiraiya that all the people in Konoha had survived the attack. If he had not imparted those wise words on him on that trip, Naruto might have just gone forward and killed Nagato, without giving the latter a chance to explain his situation. For that, he thanked Jiraiya. And then, all this had gone to hell fairly quickly. Before he knew it, he was being sent to a turtle island with the false pretense of it being a mission. There, he had learned to wield Karama's power slightly better, and once he had gotten a hang of using the fox's chakra, he realized one thing that he was being hidden there, while his friends sacrificed themselves on the battlefield. That simple fact in itself was unacceptable, and he along with his new friend and temporary mentor Killer B, had broken all barriers around the island to pass through. Since then, a lot of things happened. He met the Rakage who challenged him in a show of speed. After defeating the cage and dodging his fastest punch, he had met with Itachi and Nagato for a brief moment, then meeting the dead Jinchuriki, showing Kurama his will to save the other Biju, befriending Kurama, meeting Madara, meeting the real Madara as a clone, taking down numerous Ido Tensei across the battlefield, finding the Zetsu infiltrators, going toe-to-toe -to -toe against all the other Biju, fighting Abito and Madara. His father and all the four Hokages had joined the battle against the Jayubi and Abito. He had been shocked when Sasuke appeared on the battlefield with his own team, and had been even more shocked when the first thing he said was that he would be Hokage. But Naruto could care less about that. He was happy that Sasuke had returned and that his torn team was back in action. The three raged through the battleground. Sakura smashing anything and everything coming in her way earning the praise of the first Hokage. He and Sasuke blitzed through the hordes of unknown creatures with their combination attacks. They had been winning and leading their side to victory when things became tough. Zetsu betrayed Abito and revived Madara using the Rin Rebirth technique. Madara summoned the Jido Meizo and decided to capture all the Biju at once and he did, nearly killing Naruto. But he came out of the ordeal alive thanks to his father transferring his half of Kurama into Naruto, Sakura keeping his heart pumping through her medical ninjutsu, Abito, bringing in the chakra of two more tailed beasts, and finally Hagoromo Atsutsuki, fusing his yang chakra with him. Naruto did not know how Sasuke survived being stabbed by Madara, but he was sure that he had gone through something similar. Madara ended up sealing the Jaiwubi into himself becoming the second Jinchuriki of the Ten Tails. And Hagoromo gave his Yang Chakra to Naruto and Yin Chakra to Sasuke. While Madara was on a level of his own, Naruto and Sasuke, thanks to the Six Paths Age Chakra, could match up to him in terms of power and speed. As if that wasn't enough, Zetsu betrayed Madara once again and sacrificed the latter's body to revive the mother of Chakra, Kagaya Atsutsuki. The battle between Kagaya and him, Sasuke, Kakashi, Abito and Sakura had been of epic proportion. Jutsus of various proportions and varieties were thrown at the goddess, but she had shrugged them all off. And then they had realized she could literally turn them into dust and could send them to different dimensions with a single glance of her Rin Sharingan. Sometimes, Naruto wondered just how many times in his life would he have to face someone with crazy hex eye techniques. First it was Niji, then Sasuke, then Itachi, then Nagato, then Ibido, then Madara and now Kagaya. Just what I god had he pissed to be cursed with fighting Dejutsu users. Why could not he be born with some cool Dejutsu too? Instead, he got himself a grumpy old fox with nigh infinite chakra. Not that he was complaining. But still. As if that wasn't enough, halfway through the battle they had found out from Black Zetsu that Kagaya had infinite chakra and that was literally speaking. So, that meant in a battle of stamina and endurance, Kagaya had the upper hand. So, they needed to finish the fight fast otherwise risk exhausting themselves. That in turn had led to some crazy strategies. He would never forget how he had used his first ever technique, the sexy jutsu, to distract the goddess. Frankly speaking he was surprised that that technique worked on her. He had half expected to be slapped through at least two dimensions after pulling out something like that. Huh, who could believe that the one technique that he had created to get back at perverts would be so useful right now. They had almost succeeded in sealing her way, but that damn teleportation of her got in the way. Their joy of almost succeeding did not last long though. As they were all teleported into some sort of dimension with too much gravity in it that it made moving extremely difficult. While Kagaya was affected similarly, she did not have to fear anything as anything Naruto and Sasuke threw at her, she could just teleport away to another dimension. She had then launched one of the deadliest attacks Naruto had ever seen, the ash killing bone technique at both him and Sasuke, with the full intent to kill them. But it was thanks to Abito sacrificing himself, both Naruto and Sasuke had survived. 
Naruto tried his ability to heal on Ibido, but it seemed that Kagaya's chakra was far more potent and corrosive than his could heal. And so, he had to watch as Ibido turned into dust, but not before apologizing for being the one to cause him the most pain. Naruto had gone into a fit of rage and had attacked Kagaya blindly, but his rage was transferred to his fighting ability, as his attacks became more deadly and efficient, but even then, there was hardly anything he or Sasuke did that could affect her anyway. Sakura had tried to launch one of her deadly punches, but that had failed, and Kagaya had flung her through the dimension like a doll. Thankfully, Kakashi-sensei had somehow pulled out a pair of Sharingan out of nowhere and appeared with a Susanoo of his own, catching Sakura effortlessly. He had then proceeded to use Yadori and Abito's Kamui ability with his Susanoo to cut through Kagaya, which seemed to have worked in weakening her slightly. Alright Sasuke, let's go, Naruto shouted as he pounced towards Kagaya from her left, his right hand outstretched. Sasuke followed pouncing at Kagaya from her right, his left hand outstretched. Sakura jumped out of Kakashi's Susanoo, pouncing on Kagaya from above with her fist reared back. Cha. Don't look down on me, you bitch. I am a woman like you, she shouted throwing her fist forward with every intent on decking the goddess. Just as Naruto and Sasuke's palm and Sakura's fist was about to connect with the Atsutsuki, Kagaya's rinnegan on her forehead flashed with power. Shinra Tensei, she said, her voice barely a whisper. And all of a sudden, the three members of Team 7 were flung away from the goddess at blinding speed by an unseen force. Naruto's eyes scrunched up in pain as he glanced at the immortal being who stared forward impassively, as if considering them of no issue. That was just like Nagato. He roared in his mind while he used a chakra fist to catch a cliffside to halt his motion. He looked around and saw Sasuke using his Susanoo to come to a stop while Kakashi had caught Sakura inside of his own Susanoo. Shit if this continues, we are surely losing. Damn it, isn't there any way to defeat her databeo? Naruto thought frantically before a clone appeared beside him. Go and contact Sasuke. See how much chakra he has before dispersing. The clone nodded and flew toward Sasuke who was currently sticking to a cliff. It stopped beside him. Sasuke, how are your reserves? Can you pull off that replacement technique you did with your Rinnegan? Naruto's clone asked with a serious face. Not good. But I think I have enough chakra to pull off at least two more Rinnegan techniques before exhausting myself completely. What about you? Sasuke replied with a grim face and panting from exhaustion. DSK. I can pull off at least one more Rasen Shuriken and a couple of Shadow Clones. Kurama is currently gathering chakra, but I don't think that would matter much. Naruto's clone answered. The situation had turned for the worse. Naruto knew there was no way they could turn the situation around. Wasn't there any other way around it? The gears in his head turned until he found an idea. The jutsu was a one-way ticket, he knew it, but that was also the only way he could think of defeating Kagaya. Naruto's clone turned towards his friend and rival and addressed him. Listen Sasuke, I have an idea. Sasuke scoffed at the prospect. An idea. The last time you said that, you ended up pulling a perverted technique out of your ass on a goddess no less. God knows how you are not three dimensions away by now. Naruto's lips pursed in a thin line before he turned to look at Kagaya now trying to kill Kakashi, who was doing his best dodging phasing through her attacks while trying to keep the pressure on her. Listen, I am serious this time. But it would take some time to initiate the jutsu. Can you and Kakashi-sensei keep Kagaya distracted long enough for me to activate the jutsu? Sasuke stared at his blonde friend with narrowed eyes filled with suspicion. There was something that that wasn't right here. Naruto, what are you trying to do? And so, Naruto explained him a part of the plan he was planning. Sasuke gave Naruto a speculative look. Are you sure that is going to work? Sasuke asked with some uncertainty. Naruto shook his head. Sasuke, we don't have time to argue right now. We need to act fast and our chakra is constantly depleting. Naruto gave Sasuke one of his brightest smiles and a thumbs up. Listen Sasuke, if everything goes all right, this will be the end of this fight. Sasuke gave him a look before nodding and rushing towards Kakashi. Naruto's clone smile faltered as he stared at the retreating form of Sasuke before dispersing and sending the information to the original. The original Naruto closed his eyes and appeared inside his mindscape. He turned around and found Kurama sitting on the floor cross-legged and his hands joined together, his eyes closed in concentration. Kurama feeling his host's presence opened his eyes and stared long and hard at the only human he ever respected other than Minato and Kishina. So, you are sure about this? You really want to go forward with this? Kurama asked his host. Naruto nodded his head and gave Kurama a small smile. Yes. I am ready. When I raced towards this battlefield, I knew that a situation like this could happen. His voice faltered slightly which he suppressed under a deep breath. I was not fully prepared for this moment, but now, I don't think there is any other way we can seal Kagaya away. You do know, if you go forward with this plan of yours you will not only give up your life, you will end up losing your dream and ever having a happy life. Kurama stated. Naruto released a sigh. 
I know. But, he paused before grinning at the fox, if I am not willing to sacrifice my all, then how can I ever dream of becoming the greatest Tokage? I will sacrifice it for a better future and a better life for the future generation. Hirama bent his head down to Naruto's level and stared at the teenager with his slitted eyes. And how do you know that your sacrifice will lead to a better future and a better life for the future generations? Naruto shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't. He then jumped and landed near Kurama's eyes and stared at the slitted eye of the fox. But just like I did with you, his lips parted and turned up into a full-blown grin, I will believe in all of my friends. And with that he jumped down and started walking away from the fox. Suddenly, his whole mindscape was filled with a deep laughter. Naruto turned around to see Kurama's head lurched backwards and him laughing. Kurama controlled his laughter and turned to look at Naruto. You know Naruto, I am glad that I met someone like you. You are so much like father that it is not even funny. He bent down once again bringing his face near to the blonde. But I see something greater than that. You may have the soul of a sure in you, but that is not the only thing that governs you. You are different and at the same time so similar. Kurama let out a hearty chuckle. You know, out of everything that happened in my life, no matter how many times I curse Hashirama, Madara and Minato, it is for them that I was able to meet you. And the funny thing is that, I had completely given up on humanity. I thought you would be the same as them, but you were different. You accepted me as a friend when all I did was make your life hell, you sacrificed your life for my siblings, even though they meant nothing to you. You are one in all and the greatest human to ever grace this world. Naruto grinned and placed his hands on the back of his head. Hey Kurama, are you becoming soft? Or were you always like this to begin with? Hirama snorted in reply. As if. This is the only time you are going to ever hear a praise from me about your dumb, stupid ass. Hey. Hirama brought his fist forward towards Naruto. That will give you enough chakra to initiate the technique. Naruto touched Kurama's fist with one of his own. Thanks for that. He looked at Kurama with a concerned look. You do know if I were to use that technique, then I would end up sealing your siblings too, right? Hirama nodded his head. I know. But I am sure they would want this than being tortured by that bitch, he said before his eyes widened in surprise. Naruto. Naruto retreated his hand from the bro fist and turned around. Kurama don't. Sasuke would need you and the chakra of all the other biju to deactivate the infinite Tsukumi. And, Naruto turned his head behind towards Kurama and gave him a bright smile, you have to guide all the nations to peace just like my friends. Kurama's eyes drooped in sadness as his ears came flat against his head. He stared at Naruto unable to say anything. He knew he could use all his chakra to power up another mode which could suck the life source of any being, but against Kagaya who was literally immortal right now, that mode would never work. Alright Brad. I won't try to stop you. But remember this, you will always have me by your side. Naruto nodded his head and closed his eyes once again, appearing in the outside world. He let his chakra cloak disperse, revealing his now torn clothes. He placed a hand over his stomach and applied chakra to his fingers before rotating his hand clockwise. Suddenly from his back, a mist of orange steam began to release. He fell down on his knees as the chakra from Kurama started leaving his body. He was panting by the time the whole chakra left his body and had coalesced into a giant fox. It was good that they were behind a cliff, but he was sure that they had felt him release Kurama from his seal. Alright Kurama, go and provide distraction, Naruto said in between deep breaths before standing up. Alright Naruto, be careful, Kurama said before giving the blonde another look and jumping up the cliff. Kurama let out a mighty roar and dashed towards the other three shinobi fighting the goddess. A few moments earlier. Bakashi used Abito's Kamui ability to phase through another of Ash killing bone thrown by Kagaya at him. He was still keeping the Susanoo intact, but it was starting to take a toll on his chakra reserves. His eyes were still trained on the rabbit goddess. Suddenly, Kagaya dodged towards the side as Sasuke pounced at her from behind. However, Sasuke did not wait for Kagaya to react and jumped towards Kakashi stopping beside him. Sasuke, where is Naruto? Kakashi asked glancing at his wayward student. He is planning something. He wants us to distract Kagaya long enough for him to use some jutsu, Sasuke informed analyzing Kagaya with his Sharingan eyes. Kakashi raised any eyebrow at Sasuke before looking forward at Kagaya. What are you planning to do Naruto? Kakashi wondered. Suddenly, the cliffside from where Sasuke had arrived crumbled as they say the nine-tailed fox racing towards Kagaya. Kakashi was relieved to see the Kaiubi, but his relief was short-lived as he noticed that instead of the chakra avatar that Naruto used, it was the real deal before his eyes widened significantly. It could only mean one thing. That Naruto had released the Kaiubi from inside of him. Alright Kakashi, this is our signal, Sasuke said as he prepared himself and dashed towards Kagaya's left. Hirama reared his head, and his mouth opened as small black and blue spheres started coalescing above his mouth until it formed into a small dark ball. Kurama swallowed the sphere, and his mouth expanded before he let go a strong beam of chakra. 
but instead of firing it at Kagaya, he fired it directly at Sasuke. Akashi, remembering what Sasuke had told him, brought his hands together in a ram seal before closing his right eye. Suddenly, blood seeped out of his closed eye as he snapped it open. The Matarasu. Black flames shot forward towards the beam combining with it and forming a pitch black chakra beam. Sasuke, who was now in position, closed his eyes and took a deep breath. He did not know what Naruto was planning, but he hoped it worked. Because if it did not, they were as good as fucked. Just when the beam was inches away from Sasuke, Sasuke snapped his left eye open. The Rinnegan flashed and in an instant, Sasuke was replaced with Kagaya who looked shocked due to the change of perspective, and a second later, the full power of the beam hit her head on causing a gigantic explosion that ripped through the dimension. Even with the Susanoo shielding them, Sakura and Kakashi had to raise their hand and shield their eyes from the harsh wind coming from the explosion. For Kagaya, the explosion caused great amount of pain to rack through her body. She felt some blood dribble down her lips. She felt two presences around her one in front of her and one behind. But before she could react, two voices called out. Dodori. And two hands pierced both of her shoulders. Her lips widened slightly in surprise seeing Indra's reincarnation and the silver-haired human in front and behind her respectively. The two of them pulled their hands out and jumped away, and she was taken by surprise once again when she saw Shura's reincarnation a few meters away from her with a yellow glowing sphere with four high-speed wind blades revolving it. Lava style. Grass and shuriken. The guy heard Ashura's reincarnation yell and throw the ball of lava towards her. The sphere screeched loudly as it shot towards her. She raised her hand painfully in an attempt to absorb it, but due to being impaled on her shoulders, her reaction time was slowed, and the Rasen shuriken hit square on causing another giant explosion to rip through the dimension. As the dust cloud subsided, Kakashi, Sasuke and Sakura were treated with the side of Kagaya with her clothes torn apart with her legs and left breast exposed. She was panting heavily and glaring at Naruto who was standing in front of her. But all three of them noticed the pale and weak look on Naruto's face. This is the end Kagaya, Naruto said slowly. Kagaya panted heavily and scowled. D damn you, Kagaya retorted. The scowl on her face increased tenfold when she felt her hands going numb. She knew her regeneration should have kicked in by now, but because of using Amanamanaka and other Rinnegan abilities, it had slowed down significantly. Not to mention, both of the attacks she had taken head on were too destructive to just regenerate moments later. Naruto shook his head and said sadly, I did not want it to come to do this. He started weaving through a certain chain of seals, something that Kakashi instantly recognized. Kakashi's eyes widened significantly in horror. No. Stop Naruto. He shouted and dashed towards Naruto. Sasuke who was confused by Kakashi's reaction, soon knew why as thanks to his Rinnegan, he saw a ghastly figure form out of Naruto's back. The figure was the epitome of horrifying, more so than the true form of Orochimaru even. The figure was carrying a dagger in its mouth, had shaggy hair and chains around its neck. W what is this? Sasuke muttered in shock and horror. What the hell are you thinking dope? As for Kakashi, the distance between him and Naruto was just too far for him to reach even in his top speed. Naruto had already invoked a contract with the Shinigami. The Gaia who with her by Akigen could see the Shinigami was shocked. The one being she had run from since the start. The one being she feared even more than the other Itsutsukis. The one being who controlled life and death in the universe. She had never realized that these petty humans had come so far as to even summon the Shinigami itself. She willed her body to move, but it did not respond to her will. I am sorry Kagaya. But for the next eternity, we are going to be trapped in the Shinigami's belly. Naruto muttered before taking a deep breath. Shinigami-sama, today I have summoned you to form a contract with you. In exchange of my soul, I want you to seal Kagaya Utsutsuki for the next eternity. It shall be done, the Shinigami replied in a sickly and horrifying tone. It pulled out the dagger from his mouth and licked it before piercing it through Naruto's belly. Naruto winced in pain but held on. The dagger cut through Kagaya's stomach before the Shinigami pulled his arm out from both and placed his dagger in his mouth. It proceeded to pierce its hand through Naruto once again, while only his hand pierced Kagaya's cut belly. The Shinigami started pulling out as a bluish-purple apparition started appearing out of Kagaya in the shape of a head and upper torso. No. Damn you Ashura. Kagaya screamed insanely as she fought to keep her soul to her. Currently, it was a war of will and a tug of war for Kagaya's soul. However, Kagaya's will seemed to be strong, as the amount of soul pulled out of the Shinigami was gradually going inside Kagaya, while the Shinigami seemed to be losing its grip on her soul. Naruto gritted his teeth in pain, anger and frustration. He could feel himself losing his strength, his chakra was running out, and all he had right now was his will, but even that was starting to run out. Kagaya's soul by now was almost inside her with just its head out, and Naruto could feel his will start to give out. Is this really going to be it? Naruto wondered as he grounded his teeth. Is my death going to be in vain? Did I just doom my friends? 
Tears were starting to well up in Naruto's eyes as he felt his failure start to fall on his shoulder. I will entrust my dream to you Naruto, Jiraiya's voice rang in his head. Become the best Hokage, Tsunade's voice said in his head. I believe in you, Naruto, old man Hiruzen's face appeared in his head as the old man gave him a smile. He is not the nine-tailed fox. He is Naruto Uzumaki, a citizen of Kanahagakure no Sato, a hard-working student, Haruka's pained face as he faced Mizuki appeared in his head. From this day on, you're no longer my master, but my rival, Konohimaru's face from three years ago appeared smiling to him. You have grown up, Naruto, Kakashi's lazy face appeared in his vision. I am sorry Naruto, Abito's sad face passed through his vision. It's a father's job to believe his son, his father's proud smile flashed through his vision. Thanks for being our son, Naruto, he felt his mother hug him. The apparition of Jiraiya, Tsunade, Hiruzen, Haruka, Niji, Abito, the Konoha Ten, Gara, Konohamaru, the Mizukijin, the Reikage, Hashirama, Tabarama, the Toads and finally Minato and Kashina, appeared behind him and gave Naruto one final push. Naruto's eyes widened and a small smile came to his face. And with a renewed vigor, Naruto roared and suddenly Kagaya felt her soul starting to being dragged out again. Kagaya's eyes widened in shock. How? She thought as the pull against her soul started increasing. She could feel herself lose. She could feel her soul being dragged out. She could feel her will being overpowered by the will of the blonde-haired child. She roared desperately, but it was of no use as now her soul was three quarters out of her body. I am not going down like this. Not again. She screamed to the heaven. Her rinnegan on her forehead flashed with incredible power as it washed over the whole dimension. A black sphere appeared above her rinnegan and crackled with power before expanding and engulfing both Naruto and Kagaya, and then shrunk and disappeared without a trace. Bakashi who had made a mad dash towards Naruto, finally reached where the two missing people were and looked around frantically. Naruto. Naruto. Where are you? Answer me Naruto. Or you will not get any Raymond for a year. Naruto. Damn it, answer me Naruto, Kakashi yelled frantically until he felt someone land beside him. His head snapped towards his right and noticed Sakura holding up Sasuke who was barely standing up, his eyes widened in horror and pain. Kakashi, Sasuke whispered before letting go of Sakura and stumbling towards Kakashi. Sasuke grabbed Kakashi by his collar and brought their faces close. Kakashi's eyes widened when he saw tears flowing out of Sasuke's eyes. Kakashi. I can't feel Naruto. I can't feel Naruto's chakra anymore. What did he do Kakashi? What the hell was that jutsu? Sasuke yelled at Kakashi's face. Kakashi's eyes widened in surprise. What do you mean you can't feel Naruto's chakra? He asked in shock. Ever since I received the sage's six path chakra, I could sense Naruto, and he could sense me no matter where or which of Kagaya's dimension we were in. But now I can't. I can't sense his chakra anymore. Sasuke informed. Kakashi lowered his head slowly as he realized what had happened. Achiha. Can you sense Kagaya's chakra? Kurama asked appearing behind them. Sasuke slowly shook his head but could not answer back. Bakashi looked at the nine-tailed fox with a look of hope. Kaiubi, do you know what happened to Naruto? Kurama bowed his head sadly as his ears drooped down. That response was enough for Kakashi to come to the conclusion. Suddenly in a poof of smoke, the four disappeared from Kagaya's dimension and appeared on their own world. Kakashi looked around himself and saw various people forming a large circle around them. He could see Minato-sensei, Hashirama-sama and Tabarama-sama in that group of people. Looking at Minato-sensei's hopeful and joyous face only made his guilt increase. Beside him, Sasuke could barely stand on his own and was leaning against Sakura who seemed equally aghast but managed to keep her act together. Kakashi, where is Naruto? Minato asked as he landed beside Kakashi. Kakashi grabbed his headband with his left hand and brought it over his left eye as a habit as tears began falling from his eyes. Minato looked at Kakashi with a concerned look. Kakashi, is his Naruto alright? Minato asked dreading for the answer. He turned his head upwards to look at Kurama, but the fox averted his head unable to look at the broken father. Minato's head dipped down, his eyes wide as realization settled down upon him. Kurama-kun, Kakashi-kun, Sasu-kun, the sage of six paths, floated towards the devastated group, what happened in there? One moment I could sense Naruto-kun in my mother's chakra, but the next moment their chakras disappeared abruptly. We don't know father, Kurama replied, Naruto was planning to seal Kagaya inside of Shinigami's belly for eternity, but then Kagaya did something, and both of them were sucked in by a dark sphere. Agoromo frowned and brought his hand up to his chin and thought. What could that sphere be? Did mother have some power that I did not know about? Agoromo sama the desperate voice of Minato cut in his thoughts, could it not be possible that Naruto was in some other dimension of Kagaya? Agoromo thought for a moment before shaking his head. If he were in any dimension of my mother, Sasuke-kun and I could have sensed him. Though Hagoromo paused in his statement as everyone looked at him in curiosity. I think both of them were sucked into the dimensional gap. 
Ashurama who had also joined the group midway, went wide-eyed, while Tabarama turned towards the sage in befuddlement. That's impossible. The dimensional gap is nothing but a myth started by some fanatic scientists. Hirazin refuted in disbelief. The sage shook his head. It may be an unpopular knowledge, but the dimensional gap does actually exist. The Rinnegan powered by the chakra from the Ten Tails allows me to use a technique that literally revolves around the dimensional gap. Anyone with an advanced Rinnegan can sense the void that exists outside our world. The sage informed. Though this is the first time I have heard someone actually access the dimensional gap. That just goes to show how strong my mother was with the Jayubi's chakra. So, there is no way to access this gap. Minato asked, his desperation clear in his voice. The sage could only shake his head sadly. I am sorry Minato-kun but there is really nothing that I can do. If I had the Jaiwubi inside me, I could bring him out of the gap. Even then it would take years to get a pinpoint on his chakra. Minato's shoulders shook as he sobbed for his son. Hashirama came beside him and patted him on the shoulder, while Hiruzen tried to console Kakashi as best as he could. Tabarama could only watch sadly, unable to help either. Suddenly, someone falling on the ground attracted everyone's attention. They turned towards the source of the sound and saw Sasuke kneeling on the ground, clutching his chest as if in pain. Sasuke kun Sakura yelled kneeling beside him. I I Sasuke muttered as he panted heavily, I could not I could not do anything. Like always. Like always, my powers are still not enough to protect anyone Sasuke sobbed out. Bakashi walked up to Sasuke and knelt beside him. Sasuke, you need to calm down. He stated. Sasuke's head snapped towards him as he looked at the silver-haired ninja incredulously. Calm down. Calm down. You want me to fucking calm down. All this time all I ever told Naruto was how I fucking hated him. I could not even tell him the reason why I hated him. I could not even tell him that he was like a brother to me. All I ever did was hurt Naruto, the only one who cared about me, and you want me to fucking calm down Sasuke shouted at Kakashi in rage. Kakashi and Sakura reared back in shock as for the first time in his life, Sasuke let lose his emotions in front of anyone. Sasuke's head was hung low as tears dropped from his eyes. Get your act together, child. A quiet voice spoke from behind everyone. All those who were present turned around and to the shock of everyone, Madara was sitting propped up against a rock, his body heavily wounded. Hashirama looked at his old-time friend sadly. Your life isn't over yet that means you still have a reason to be alive. Don't let your brother's sacrifice go in vain. Madara said in a quiet voice. And what do you want me to do, huh? Plot for the next hundred years, wage a war on the nation, to bring some peace by controlling everyone and putting them in a dream. Sasuke raged out staring angrily at Madara. Madara let out a hollow chuckle. No. That plan failed no, that plan was to fail since the beginning. Madara stared at Sasuke. Take it from me child, don't follow my path. I lost everything when Izuna died and I lost my way. I was consumed by my own madness. He turned his head towards Hashirama. Once I told you that your way was supposed to fail, and yet my way was an even bigger failure, I just wish I could have realized that sooner. The best way you can keep your brother alive is to keep his dream alive. Make his dream your own and strive to achieve it just like he would. Indeed, Sasuke. My son would never want you to mop around for him. Minato stated with a small smile. For Sasuke, he could clearly visualize Naruto being like that. Hoi, what are you crying for team? You sad or something, Dadabeo. Let's go and have a bowl of ramen, and you will feel all your worries leave you. He heard Naruto's voice ring in his mind as he smiled and clenched his fist. He abruptly stood up with a determined look. I know what I will do. He stated with finality in his voice. Becoming Hokage is a long shot for me. He turned to look at Sakura. Sakura, you will become Hokage just like Naruto wanted to do. Sakura blinked in shock and nodded numbly. Her eyes clearly glistening with dried up tears. Hiruzen looked at Sasuke. And what will you do Sasuke-kun? He asked. Sasuke looked at the third Hokage. I will help maintain the peace from the shadows. That's where I have lived for so long and that's from where I will work, just like Itachi. There will always be someone who will want to destroy the peace we will establish, and I will make sure that they don't even come close to it. Hiruzen nodded in appreciation. Well, in that case I will give you the only advice I can give. Don't become like Danzo in your endeavor. Sasuke snorted in disgust. Don't compare me to him. I would become nothing like him. I will kill myself before that. Ashurama knelt beside Madara's prone body and looked at him sadly. It seems that we don't have to worry about the future generation anymore, eh Madara? It would seem so, Madara stated looking at the sky, Hashirama, where did I go wrong? When did I fail? Ashurama shook his head sadly. Not only you Madara. All of us failed too. But let's not worry about it anymore, eh? You know, when we go to the afterlife, let's have a cup of sake for old times sake. Madara smiled glancing at the sky. Old times, huh? I would like that. 
And finally, Madara Echeha closed his eyes and departed the land of living. Ashurama stood up just as his body started glowing and began to crack. He felt his soul start to leave his body. He looked at the young Echeha and smiled. Sasu Kun, he called out, learn from the mistakes and failures of the past generation and move forward to make a better life for the future generation. Sasuk nodded as Hashirama's body crumbled into dust and his soul began ascending towards heaven. Finally, I can rest in peace, Tabarama said with a smile as his body crumbled too. One by one, all the cages surrounding the group started crumbling away and their souls ascended towards heaven. Minato looked at Kakashi and smiled sadly at him. Take care Kakashi, he said, and his body crumbled into dust. I will let you four handle the rest of the things, the sage said before his body disappeared from the plane of existence too. Let's go. We have work to do, Sasuke said, and started moving away followed by Kakashi and Sakura. Hirama sat there in his position and glanced up to the sky. Naruto, wherever you are, I hope you are safe. He prayed before following before the remaining members of Team 7. He could feel it. The way that the very air around him seemed to want to rip him to shreds. That his very being there was never supposed to happen. That this place was slowly killing him. The same thing could not be said for Kagaya though. But then again, she was not called a goddess for no reason it seems. Why? He turned his head, meeting the enraged gaze of his divine neighbor. She was glaring at him, the goddess who was trying to end the world, was staring at him incredulously, as if he was the one who had tried to doom humanity. Her eyes hardened further, why did you just throw away this world last chance at true peace? His eyebrow cocked, as his mouth fell wide open, excuse me. Her face was marred by a grimace full of hate and despair. How could you doom the world? Wait a second. What? The blonde Yuzumaki stared right back at her, the hell do you mean how could I doom the world, that was you doing the whole world dooming. Not me. Ignorant human, are you really so blind she spat, those other humans you left behind are just going to continue the bloodshed that they have done for all these years. I'm trying to save them. The hell you were. He shouted back incredulously, you tried to mind fuck all of us and turn every human into your own personal Zetsu army. That ain't peace. They would be living a lie. They would have been happy. She shot back, they would have fulfilled their every want. They would have had all their wishes come true. She took a breath, that would have certainly been better than the blood-soaked reality they belonged, Tukagaya's features morphed into pity, and now they'll be forced right back into that reality and kill each other all over again. Silence. Silence reigned throughout the space, as both occupants felt their senses becoming more and more dull every second. Naruto looked up into the blank sky. It was just black. And blank. And soon he wouldn't be able to see even that. He had stopped arguing with Kagaya, simply because he couldn't anymore. He was tired, exhausted after his many hours of fighting, and didn't want to spend his last moments arguing in some dispute. At least he could pass knowing that everyone back home was safe. Even the Biju within him couldn't find it in themselves to speak, as their chakra was also being ripped from existence itself. He sighed, as it appeared that the rabbit goddess had decided to begin another berating spree. You humans can't eve. He stopped her, holding out his arm towards her, his hand forming a fist. Super Gramps taught me that way to use chakra the way it was supposed to be used, I think he called it Ninshu or something like that. He elaborated, still looking ahead of him. I don't know why you did what you did, and I can't agree with it either, but maybe I can understand the person behind it, at the very least. He finished. The goddess stared at the appendage with wide eyes. In any other scenario, she would have ripped it from his body and burned it, but she hadn't seen Ashura's successor so solemn. She had observed her opponents, and he had always been energetic. But these were both of their last moments, and she was a bit curious why he had destroyed her plans for world peace. She reciprocated the gesture, extending her remaining arm and tapping her hand against his. Soon, each of them was filled by every single one of the feelings of the other, connected by their chakra. Naruto felt as if a cold river had run through his entire body, a lingering chill still finding its way through his body. Her chakra seemed cold, but weighed down. Burdened in a way, weighed down by responsibility and sadness. Sadness knowing that the ones she sought to protect were killing one another for petty things like money. Watched as her lands were ravaged and her people were killed. Watched as she was sealed by her ignorant sons. Reawakened, only to be thwarted as her chakra was eliminated from the world, ending the infinite Tsukiyomi, and lay slowly fading away next to the one responsible. The Gaia felt as if the sun's rays were being poured over her, as if her whole body was being bathed in comforting, warm water, relaxing her entire body. His chakra was bright, and so, so warm and it contained an accepted and reformed darkness. His happiness at his accomplishments and friends. His hatred for being mistreated. His sadness for being unable to do anything as his grandfather figure, his godfather, and his friend died. A final flash of pride and longing as he sacrificed himself on a slight hunch, leaving the future of his world to people he trusted. A realization that even for all the things she had done, he did not hate the woman lying next to him. And so, the two experienced one another. 
their hopes, their dreams. He pulled back his fist, cutting the connection. The cold disappearing from his body as her chakra seeped back into her. Kagaya felt as the warmth left her body, leaving behind a longing. How could he not hate her after all she had done? At Ninshu her son had discovered. It was an interesting experience. Pure. Unadulterated. Understanding. This was the legacy she had wanted to leave, but her son had come up with a way for people to do it in seconds. He had intended for people to use it for understanding. She had come to know everything that was Naruto Uzumaki, and the reverse was true for him, as he came to know Kagaya. She understood him, and him her. It was wonderful. She looked at the transmigrant of Ashura. His will to live was strong. She was a relic of an age-long past, who had tried to destroy the future he had worked so hard for all his life. It was time for her to repent for her mistakes, and while maybe her next actions would not be much of a big path towards repentance, she knew it would still be the right thing. She floated towards the limp body of the blonde and placed a hand on his chin, admiring him just like how Tsunade would do. You are so much like my son, yet so different. She said before letting go of him. Since you are as sure as reincarnation, that would technically make me your grandmother. What are you getting at lady? Naruto asked dryly. Quiet, she said sternly and Naruto immediately shut up, I want to tell you something. Will you let me? I am quite sure you are aware that you don't have much time. Naruto nodded his head slowly. The Gaia closed her eyes and took a deep breath. You see, I came from a clan which lived on another planet. Wait, you're an alien? Naruto asked incredulously. The Gaia's eyes twitched. Yes, I do, now shut up. Once again Naruto clamped his mouth shut. As I was saying I belong to a clan from another planet. You see the members of the Atsutsuki clan were like parasites. The leader of all Atsutsuki would assign two members one from the high class families and the other from the low class families to a galaxy. I was from the low class families and along with me another from a high class family was assigned to this galaxy, especially Earth. The other member's name was Asiki Atsutsuki. The duty of these two members was to go throughout the galaxy and search for inhabitable planets and plant a seedling in that planet. The Jaiwubi that you fought was a seedling. Once it is planted, the Jaiwubi would grow sucking the world of all its chakra and turn into a tree the god tree and would then yield a single fruit which if consumed, the being would transcend into something higher. However, I absolutely abhorred this cruelty. To other Atsutsuki members, it did not matter if the planet had living beings on it or not. For them all it mattered was to cultivate a chakra fruit and transcend. However, there was something else that I abhorred as well. You see, we from the Atsutsuki clan had a sort of tradition. If the member from the low-class family became useless, he or she would have to convert themselves into a chakra fruit for the high-class member to consume and preserve their power and genetics. I absolutely despised this tradition, and before I could lose my usefulness I killed my higher-up and consumed the chakra fruit instead, which granted me immortality and many of my other abilities. And why are you telling me this? Naruto asked. That is because, once I convert myself into a chakra fruit, I want you to consume me. Kagaya stated. What? No, I can't do that. And you said it yourself, you hated that tradition. Naruto refuted incredulously. The Gaia smiled softly at Naruto. Naruto, listen to me. This is what I wish. I am a relic of the past, and I did many wrong things in my life. I did a lot of horrendous things to the very beings I swore to protect. Naruto, I want to repent for my mistake, and even though it may not amount for much, but it would still save your life and if everything goes alright, then you may find your way back to your world. But, Naruto tried to reason, but Kagaya shut him up by putting a finger on his lips. As I said, it is something I want. I have lived my life. You have just started, Kagaya said compassionately, I believe you have so much still to do. So, please accept this last gift from me. Naruto reluctantly nodded. Even though he did not like the situation, she was literally forcing her will on him. Though I must warn you, Kagaya warned, I don't know what kind of changes your body will go, not only after eating my chakra fruit, but also the Jaiwubi's chakra fruit inside of me. There may be none but at the same time, there can be a drastic one. But you should retain your human body. Naruto gave a nod again. And before I go, I need to warn you about another thing, Kagaya face turned grim, the Utsutsuki clan is an interdimensional clan. So, no matter where you go, some of them are sure to follow after you. I don't know how long it will take, maybe days, weeks, months, maybe even years, depending on how fast they locate you. So, you need to be prepared for their arrival. Naruto gave a determined nod. Kagaya smiled at him softly before closing her eyes as her body started shrinking until all its place remained a watermelon-sized fruit with a blood-red color. The fruit floated towards Naruto who grabbed it in his hands. He looked at the fruit unsure of his next actions. Well, here it goes I guess, he murmured to himself before taking a bite from the fruit. Huh, nothing happened. He thought before he ate the whole fruit. 
It was weird to eat a fruit that was an alien, a goddess, no less just a few minutes ago, but Naruto did not let his mind wander towards those thoughts. Suddenly, a burst of chakra was released from Naruto's body, and he felt himself choke. He grabbed his throat as he hunched forward in pain. He cried out as he felt his body start burning, and he could feel himself lose consciousness. He tried to reach out, but to no avail. W what's happening? Those were his last thoughts as he slipped into unconsciousness. Chapter 2, Into the New World, Leary eyes slowly started opening as our blonde protagonist finally returned to consciousness, feeling groggy and disoriented. Yet he oddly felt refreshed, as if some new energy had overtaken him. He felt as if he had woken from a decade-long sleep, yet he did not feel any kind of kink in his body. What happened? He thought. The last thing he remembered was eating the fruit that Kagaya had turned into. He had felt himself almost choked to death, and then, nothing. He remembered nothing after that. As Naruto's vision cleared, he found himself once again in the same black void-like space where he had last interacted with Kagaya and had lost consciousness. Naruto moved his right arm up and rubbed his eyes to get rid of the bleariness in them. As his eyes cleared, he stared at his raised arm and found that they seemed the same as before he had consumed Kagaya's chakra fruit. Frowning, he raised his other arm and found that they too had little change. They seemed the same. He moved his head down and found that there was no change in his torso, either. Everything seemed the same. There was no change in his appearance, it seemed. Well, I guess I did not change appearance-wise much. I still look the same as before I consumed Kagaya. Thank the sage. I dreaded I would end up growing some weird horns on my head like Kagaya or Madara. Naruto thought in his mind. But now that I think about it, it is kinda disappointing. However, the same could not be said about how he felt, though. It felt like he had eaten thousands of energy potions all at once. That much energy was flowing through him. He felt way too energized for someone who had just woken up from a coma. Even before, when he would have rested at the Kanoha hospital, he never felt this revitalized. Next was his chakra. Trying to feel for his chakra, he was amazed. If before his chakra was the size of Kanoha, now it felt like it was all the five great ninja villages combined. There felt like an endless stream of chakra running through his body. I wonder whether my chakra capacity has matched that of Kagaya's and Madara's when he absorbed the Jayubi. Limitless, like the sky. Naruto wondered in awe. Next came his body. While he could not see any alterations in his appearance, his body sure did not feel like it. His body felt much more strengthened. Much more powerful than before. It was like he was on steroids or something. But right now, he felt like he could lift the whole Hokage monument and do squats while carrying it. Naruto released a sigh. It was all overwhelming to him. Especially what happened the last few days with him. Fighting a war, sacrificing yourself, ending up in an endless dark void, and then eating up someone who tried to kill you, would end up doing that to anyone. He was disgusted with himself, though. Disgusted at himself for eating Kagaya. Naruto's face dropped, and a regretful look appeared on his face. What the hell was I thinking, eating her like that? Why did I eat her like that? It was not right. I should have persuaded her against it. Damn it. Naruto cursed himself. He waited for someone to say something, but that was too much to be expected. He was after all, in an endless void, all alone. No one was there to say anything to him or listen to him. What on Sage's log came upon me? Naruto thought, his face scowling as he cursed himself for such a heinous act. But then his expression softened. But it was something she wanted. Something she hoped would right even a little of all the wrongs she had done, and it seemed my own survival instinct kicked in, no matter how unfortunate. Naruto ran a hand through his torso, feeling his rough skin. Also, the weathering feeling from before when I entered the void seems to be gone. I don't feel like eroding anymore. So, that means Kagaya's chakra fruit actually did its job. He released a sigh and ran a hand through his silky hair. I can't let her sacrifice go to waste. She gave me a new opportunity. A new chance at life. But before that, I need to find a way to leave this place. A frown then settled on his face. But the thing is how do I get out of this place? Naruto crossed his arms over his chest and started thinking hard very hard. But no solution came to him. He had no idea of how to get out of this place at least not with his current arsenal. He briefly wondered if summoning a Rasengan and swinging it in the air randomly would maybe rip a hole here or there, but the idea was soon discarded when he realized just how ridiculous the plan seemed. Naruto's thoughts were interrupted when suddenly out of nowhere he heard a loud, rumbling voice in the dark void. Woohoo. Look at me go, baby. Look at me, office. Can you do that? I bet you can't with that pathetically little body of yours. Ha ha ha. Naruto turned his head towards the source of the sound, and much to his amazement, something was flying in this void. He squinted his eyes to see the figure clearly, and once again, Naruto was taken by surprise. In the dark, the endless void was a creature as large as Kurama. From a distance, it looked like a lizard made of metal. It was as red as blood and had a horn growing out of its snout. It had four clawed limbs. 
On its back, there were two pairs of wings as large as the Hokage Monument. All in all, the creature would have looked intimidating that is if the creature was not sprouting nonsense and doing backflips through the air like a baby bird. Huh, I wonder if he it. She. Can help me get out of this place, Naruto thought. And with that, Naruto started flaying his hands to reach the creature. Vatican City. Vatican City, also known in full as the state of the Vatican City and in Italian as Stato della Città del Vaticano, is an ecclesiastical state and the seat of the Roman Catholic Church. It is an enclave in Rome, situated on the west bank of the Tiber River. Vatican City is the smallest fully independent nation-state in the world. Within its medieval and renaissance walls existed some of the most important buildings in the world. The Vatican Apostolic Library is one of the oldest existing libraries in the world and contains one of the most significant collections of historical texts. The St. Peter's Basilica, the church raised above the tomb of St. Peter the Apostle, is the second most important building in Christendom. And finally, the Vatican Palace, where the Pope lived. Located outside the gates of the Vatican City at the Piazza dell'Esculino was the Basilica of St. Mary Major, one of the four churches with the title of Basilica. This church, however, was not any normal church by any means. This church was owned by the Holy Seat and was guarded not by the Italian police force, but by the police force of the Vatican City. This church was one of the many churches where soldiers for heaven were trained and armed. Most of these soldiers were trained from an early age of 11 and were allowed to join heaven's forces by the time they reached the age of 16. Most of these soldiers consisted of orphans who were either left at the church door by their parents or were part of an orphanage that was run by the church itself. Some of them also had families who were connected to the church somehow. In return for a livelihood for these orphans, the church trained the children so that one day they could become warriors of their religion, fight for their faith, and defend it at any cost. Two of these countless children were Zenovia Korda and Irina Shidu, who were currently standing in an empty clearing not far away from the church. Zenovia Korda was a 15-year-old girl. She had a unique shade of blue as her hair color which was short and came up to her shoulder. She originated from Italy. Her birth mother had abandoned her at the doorstep of the Vatican. A sister from the Catholic Church took her in. The sister had raised her like her own child throughout her life. Zenovia wanted to honor the woman who was like a mother to her and wanted to become the strongest woman in the church's forces, just like her mother figure. Like her mother figure, she too was greatly faithful to the Almighty and had a firm belief that if someone did not follow God, that meant he was a heretic. Irina Shidu was also a 15-year-old girl. She had orange hair which was tied in two ponytails. Unlike her blue-haired partner, she had a Japanese origin and was raised by her parents who were part of the Protestant church. She had spent most of her earlier years going to church and praying to God. Her faith in the Almighty was firm, and not even God himself would be able to shake her belief in him. She too wanted to be a strong woman in the church's forces and serve heaven like her father. Currently, the two partners were training their skills in swordsmanship. In seven months, both of them would be inducted into the church's active forces and would be sent on missions to exercise devils, demons, and fallen angels alike. Both of the girls were eager to enlist in the church's ranks and do their best to please God. Just like them, their respective churches were also looking forward to their induction. After all, both of them wielded some of the strongest weapons the church had at its disposal. Zenovia clutched her wooden sword tightly in her hands as she stared at her orange-haired partner and currently her opponent. In most of their spars, she had come out on top. But as time went by and Irina continued practicing, the gap between them was decreasing too. She was actually happy to have someone like her to train with and improve her own skills. All right Irina, are you ready? The blue-haired teen asked. The orange-haired teen smirked as she replied, as ready as I can ever be. Zenovia did not wait any longer. With a battle cry, she rushed at her opponent. In response, Irina steadied her own stance and brought her wooden sword close to her chest. The two girls clashed wooden swords against each other. The sound of wood hitting wood rang throughout the clearing as the two girls continued their bout. Zenovia bent her leg and went for a low sweep with her sword, trying to hit her opponent's knees. Irina in a moment of fine acrobatics, jumped over Zenovia. Doing a half flip in the air, Irina gripped her sword tighter and slashed it horizontally, trying to smash it against Zenovia's skull. Zenovia, noticing her opponent's motives, immediately bent down, avoiding the sword and in a moment of speed, spun herself around and went for a hit at Irina's waist. Irina, reacting immediately, brought her sword down and blocked the attack before pushing it away from her and landing on her feet. All of this happened within a few seconds. Both the opponents stared at each other with challenging stares. Just as the two of them were about to continue their spar, a shadow fell upon the clearing, darkening the area. The two girls, in a moment of curiosity and confusion, looked up at the sky, only to be amazed at what they saw. There over the clearing was a gigantic portal with a swirling mass of purple moving like a whirlpool. It was so big that it blocked the sun from shining on the clearing and darkened the whole area of the clearing. Zenovia was the first one to get over her shock. Arena. 
Quick. It may be an attack. Zenobia's panicked voice brought Arena out of her own state of shock. Both the girls dropped their wooden swords and dashed towards the trees surrounding the clearing. They wanted to get as far away from the portal and hopefully get away from whatever the portal was about to bring. Zenobia eyed the object covered in white bandages, leaning against one of the trees in the direction she was heading. Reaching for the object, she immediately grabbed it by the hilt. Swinging it over her shoulder, she secured it at her back. The two girls, once out of the portal's way, hid behind a tree and waited in anticipation as to what was coming out of it. One could literally see sweat dripping from their foreheads as they waited anxiously. Suddenly, a loud and rumbling voice surprised both of them, especially considering how angry the voice seemed. You foolish hatchling. Don't show me your face if you don't want to die. The voice was followed by a gigantic gust of wind. Both the girls had to cover their eyes to prevent any dust from going into them. And then suddenly, much to their surprise, a figure the size of a normal human flew out of the portal and crashed on the ground, creating a crater at least 10 feet in size and sending dust clouds flying everywhere. As the boy crashed, the portal and the sky vanished. The clearing was then filled with silence. X Xenovia. W what was that J just now? Irina asked, breaking the silence that had fallen over the clearing. She was greatly apprehensive about the appearance of the new figure. I, I don't know Irina. Zenovia replied, just as apprehensive as the other. As should we approach it? Zenovia frowned and thought and a few seconds later nodded. She swung the object on her back away from its resting place and unwrapped the bandages covering it, revealing a shiny, silver broadsword as long as her. She carried the blade in front of her with ease in her hands as she held it in a defensive position. Irina followed Zenovia's example and untied the ribbon currently tied to her left biceps. With one swipe, the ribbon transformed into a katana. Holding it in front of her, Irina gave a nod towards Zenovia, who nodded back. The two of them slowly made their way towards the figure that was probably lying in the crater unconscious right now. But for the third time that day, both of them were taken by surprise when they heard a voice a male voice. Oh w damn. That hurt. Wait. I don't feel any pain. Whoa. So cool. I am way more durable than before. Irina wasn't sure whether she wanted to sweat drop at the intruder's cheerful tone or frown at the fact that even after such a fall, the intruder did not seem to be harmed in the slightest. She glanced at her blue-haired partner, whose eyes were narrowed and focused on the crater. Whoever it is in that crater was strong enough to survive such a crash, Irina said in a whispered voice. By no means is he a normal human. It got an affirmative nod from the blue-haired girl. As the dust cleared, it finally allowed the two girls to get a clear image of the figure in the crater. At the center of the crater stood a boy who looked to be their age, maybe one or two years older than them. He had spiky bright blonde hair and tanned skin. The most distinguishing feature of his had to be the weird whisker marks on his face, which gave him an uncanny resemblance to a fox. As for his clothes, he was only wearing pants, but by the looks of it, it seemed the pants had gone through hell and high, especially with how tethered they looked. Another odd feature, the orange-haired girl noted, was on the boy's forehead. It looked like a headband with a metal plate on it, and if Irina had read it correctly from a distance, it had the kanji of shinobi inscribed on it. There was a necklace with a green-colored crystal hanging around his neck. Irina blushed heavily when her eyes landed on the boy's torso. It gave the youngster an Olympic athlete look because it was slim, V-shaped, and had six abs. Despite having rippled and buff muscles, they were not as buff as those of a bodybuilder, although they were still noticeable and quite desirable. The boy looked like a Greek statue sculpted by the finest of artists. Glancing at Zenovia, Irina was once again shocked to see the faint reddening of the blunette's cheeks. Is the Zenovia, the emotionless girl, the most asexual girl I had the pleasure of knowing, blushing. Ah, oh, where the hell am I now? Irina heard the boy say. She turned her eyes towards him and found him turning his head frantically, as if trying to find something. And then, the boy looked at them. Oh. Hello there, the blonde-haired boy waved at them, by any chance do you know where I am? Irina's mouth dried up as she tried to find the right words to say. When that portal had opened up, she had expected a lot of things, but what she had not expected was to see a boy, maybe a few years older than them, fly out of it. By his looks, she would have identified him as a human, a very fit and fine human that is if he had not crashed on the ground with enough force to create a crater and kill a normal person. Who are you? Irina heard her partner ask, or more like demand, in Italian. She deadpanned at the blue-haired girl. Did she actually ask someone in Italian who had just spoken in Japanese moments earlier? However, the boy instead of answering, tilted his head in confusion. Huh? What was that? Irina deadpanned at her partner. Zenovia, the boy just asked a question in Japanese. What are you doing asking him a question in Italian? Zenovia's blush returned full scale, but she suppressed it behind an expressionless mask. Who are you? She demanded, this time in Japanese. For the umpteenth time, Irina cursed Zenovia for her bluntness and demanding attitude. This boy was by no means a normal teenager. 
If his short display of durability were to be believed, this guy was easily stronger than them. Irina thought that if the blonde was miffed by Zenobia's demand, he did not show it. Instead, he smiled brightly and pointed at himself with his thumb. Oh, me. The name's Naruto Uzumaki. The most unpredictable weight the boy stopped before his brows scrunched in a thoughtful look. Kakashi Sensei said that we should not give away our identities without confirming if someone is a threat or not. He then looked at the two girls and said, I guess I can't tell you anything without confirming whether you are a threat or not. Zenobia's stoic face turned into a sneer. If there would be anyone confirming if anyone is a threat or not, it is us, Cretan. Zenobia said, her voice as scorching as lava. Now, Cretan. Tell us who you are. And what are you doing here? Naruto's face morphed into one of shock. Cre Cretan his face then turned into an equally heated sneer. Let me tell you, something lady, I am no Cretan. I am Naruto Uzumaki, you hear. I care not for your name Cretan. Tell us what you are doing here, and we will decide what your punishment will be. The blonde-haired boy sighed. Lady, I am here looking for a way home. Just tell me where I am, and I will be gone. Irina gained a hopeful look on her face. Maybe if they told him about their location, he would leave them alone. She really had no wish to fight him, especially with no knowledge of his strengths. Poor Irina. Zenobia had no such plan planned. That matters not, Cretan. You entered our area, an area protected by the church, through an unknown portal through which we could also hear a menacingly loud voice. So, until you tell us who you are and what you want, we will be the ones to decide what we will do with you. For the second time today, my name is Naruto. Naruto Uzumaki. And church. What the heck is a church? Zenobia clicked her tongue in frustration. So, you don't even know what a church is, do you, Cretan? You must be the worst kind of heretic then. The heretic. First Cretan, now heretic. Really, lady. What the hell did I deserve to get such insulting names from you? Anyone who does not believe in our god is a heretic, Cretan. Zenobia answered with a sneer. And you? You don't even know what a church is. Something that everyone, even children know. You are the worst kind of heretic. And all heretics must die. Naruto ignored the blue-haired girl and turned toward the orange-haired one. He pointed at the former as he deadpanned at the latter. What, in Sage's name, is up with her? Irina laughed awkwardly. Oh, well. That's just the way she is. She was really happy to have Zenobia as her partner, really, she was. But sometimes she just wished the girl would just shut up and not antagonize everyone in sight. Zenobia did not like the way she was ignored. She let out a growl and jumped at Naruto from the top of the crater, her broadsword held in two hands and raised above her head. Irina's eyes widened in shock. Wait, Zenobia. She yelled at her partner, but to no avail. Naruto's eyes widened as he saw Zenobia jump at him. He began waving his hands wildly. Wait. 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 I don't want to fight. I came here in peace. However, Zenobia paid him no attention. Die. She screamed as she descended on Naruto, her hand swinging her sword in a vertically downward slash. Naruto realizing that she did not intend on stopping, whipped out the only kunai he had left and brought it up. Sword met kunai. For the first time today, Naruto was taken by surprise due to the force behind the sword slash. It was like taking a half-hearted punch from Sakura when she was frustrated with him. His eyes traveled towards his kunai which seemed to crack behind the force of the sword. The force of the clash had caused another crater to form inside the crater. And stay here. The kunai is sure to break. Naruto thought. But that, the blonde kicked the blue net away from him and jumped back to create some distance between them. He glanced at his cracked kunai before turning towards Zenobia, who was on her knees. The heck is wrong with that sword? It packed way too much power than any sword I have seen. Suddenly, Naruto sensed someone behind him. He turned his head slightly and through the corner of his eyes, noticed the orange-haired girl from before behind him, her sword drawn sideways for a horizontal slash. As Rina slashed her sword horizontally, Naruto ducked at the end moment and was about to kick her away from him, when, much to his amazement and awe, the sword turned into a whip which wrapped itself around his neck. The heck is wrong with these swords? One is way too strong than it should be, and the other can literally shapeshift. What's going on here? Naruto thought. He was intrigued by both swords. By now, one thing was clear to him. He was no longer in his world. But some world where swords could do weird shit. Oh. And people talked in some weird language too. But then again, he should really not be surprised at this point. After everything he had gone through at this point, this should really be considered a daily dose of weirdness in his life. Through the corner of his eyes, he noticed Irina had already distanced herself away from him. What's she doing? He wondered, okay, I need to get out of this whip. Naruto wondered if he should use a substitution jutsu to get out of the grip of the whip when suddenly, he sensed someone above him and a shadow fell over him. His eyes traveled up before they widened in shock as he saw Zenobia descend on him, with all the intent of actually killing him. Should I really need to get out here? Naruto thought in desperation. 
while he believed he could tank a direct blow from the sword, there was still a possibility that there was some form of ridiculous shit he had yet to see. And frankly, he was so done with surprises. He was really starting to hate surprises by now. Naruto's eyes widened as he saw Zenobia's blade inches away from hitting him. Damn it, no time to substitute. What the heck do I do? That's when something weird happened. Naruto's left eye flashed purple, and in a second, Naruto found himself out of the grip of Arena's sword and in midair, exactly in Zenobia's position. Naruto blinked in surprise before looking back. His eyes widened in amazement as he noticed Zenobia now in his place, tightly gripped by Arena's sword whip. What? What just happened? Did I replace myself with her? Suddenly, the memory of Sasuke replacing himself with one of his truth-seeking orbs flashed through his mind. Wait. Did I just use one of Rinnegan's abilities? Does that mean I have acquired the Rinnegan? Naruto gained his composure as he landed on his feet. He turned towards the two girls who had just attacked him as he noticed Arena withdraw her sword whip, freeing Zenobia from its grip. The orange-haired girl then ran over to the blue-haired one as she kneeled beside the latter. Zenobia. Are you alright? What happened? How did you get to his place? The orange-haired girl asked her teammate worriedly. I, I don't know Arena. Zenobia answered as she rubbed her sore neck. She raised her head and glared heatedly at Naruto. What did you do, heretic? Naruto frowned at her before shrugging. I have no idea. He had an idea, but no way was he telling them that. Don't lie to me. I noticed your left eye flash purple, and then suddenly, I was in your place. You must have done something. Zenobia said heatedly. Her glare deepened. Uh, it seems I guessed right. I really have no idea what I just did there. He raised his hands in a surrendering manner. Really. I am telling you the truth. Zenobia clicked her tongue in frustration as she stood up on her feet. Irina glanced at her teammate worriedly. The orange-haired girl really hoped Zenobia would not escalate the situation any further. TSK. Seems we will have to beat the answer out of you. The bluenet growled. Wait. Zenobia Arena tried to protest, however, another voice from behind her interrupted her. The female voice. The female voice with an angelic yet stern tone in it. The female voice she was very familiar with. By the god's name, what is going on here? Arena froze completely. Oh god, we are in trouble. She is here she thought. Beside her, she could feel her partner freeze up, too. The two girls immediately spun behind to face the woman standing behind them. Naruto looked at the source of the voice behind the girls and blushed lightly. The woman had blonde hair, a shade duller than his. She had an angelic face with crystal blue eyes. Her face held a stern look on them. She was currently wearing some weird dress consisting of black material that reached the ground and had long sleeves with white colored ends. She wore a veil over her head. Overall, Naruto felt that she had to be one of the most beautiful women he had ever seen in his life. Zenobia, Irina. Kindly explain to me what is going on here. Naruto heard the blonde woman say it in that weird language. He was still wondering what language they were speaking. Sister Griselda, we were just engaging this hostile human. Naruto blinked as he heard the blue-haired maniac say in what looked like the same language as the woman. Hostile, you say. Irina, do you agree with Zenobia? The woman said, and Naruto soon blanked out their conversation, seeing as he could make no head and heel of what they were saying, and a much more productive thing to do would be to find a way to get to his home. Um I mean, he was not hostile or anything. I mean he did not attack us or such, Irina answered hesitantly, averting her eyes away from Zenobia who gave her a betrayed look. Griselda released an exasperated sigh. I figured as much. Zenobia, you can't let your anger against the opposite gender blind you. It would only hamper your duty. Zenobia glared at nothing in particular but did not answer back. Am I understood? Griselda asked in a stern tone. Yes, Sister Griselda, Zenobia replied, through clenched jaws. The blonde-haired woman then looked past the two girls. She had been observing their conversation and fight for some time. She had already concluded that this youngster was more complex than first appeared. The boy was much more agile than anyone his age, not to mention was trained. The only saving grace for the boy was that he seemed non-hostile, what with him pleading to Zenobia to stop the fight. Otherwise, she would have actually believed Zenobia and considered the boy hostile. She walked up and stood in front of the two girls. And who might you be, young man? Griselda asked Naruto. Naruto realized that the blonde woman was talking to him. He briefly wondered how the three of them knew his language, but paid it no mind yet. He could research on that respect once he was done here. Who me? Naruto asked, pointing at himself, though he did not wait for her answer, as he replied. I am Naruto Uzumaki. At your service, my lady. The woman giggled and Naruto found himself unconsciously blushing at how melodic her laugh sounded. My, quite the charming man, you are. Anyway, I am Griselda Quarta and these two here, she then pointed at the two girls standing behind her. The blue-haired one is Zenovia Quarta, and the orange-haired one is Irina Shidu. I am quite sure the two of them forgot to introduce themselves. 
The two girls blushed in embarrassment at the woman's quip. Naruto smiled at her. It's alright. I did not mind at all, Griselda-san. That's Griselda-sama for you, Cretan. Zenovia retorted harshly. The degraded remark pierced Naruto's heart again as he hunched over. What's her problem with me? What have I ever done to her? Griselda released a sigh. Zenovia, enough. Zenovia fell silent and dropped her gaze to the ground, choosing to glare at the grass under her feet. Anyway, can I inquire what you are here for, young man? Griselda inquired as she looked at the blonde-haired young man. Oh I was cough. Naruto covered his mouth and coughed. As he removed his hand and looked at them, his eyes widened as he saw blood on them. What? What's going on? Naruto thought in fright. Suddenly, his chest constricted in pain as he fell to his knees and hunched over. He coughed more and then, out of nowhere, he puked out blood. Seeing Naruto fall to his knees, Griselda had already rushed over to him, followed by Irina. Zenovia stood her ground as she stared at the blonde-haired boy with mild worry. Uzumaki-san. Uzumaki-san. Are you alright? Griselda asked as she kneeled beside him, just as Naruto puked out a lot of blood, shocking her. Irina stood beside her, watching the blood in horror. I Naruto wheezed out, his voice weak. I don't feel so good. He said before falling on his stomach, unconscious. Sister Griselda, is he alright? Irina asked, her voice laced in worry. Griselda looked at Naruto with concerned eyes. She took hold of his hand and felt for a pulse, and much to her relief, she found one, albeit a weak one. It seems he is still alive, but his pulse is really weak. What should we do with him? Irina asked. Griselda considered her options for a few seconds before making up her mind. We take him to our healers. It would be immoral for us to leave him here to die. Are you sure about this sister Griselda? Zenovia protested. I mean he could be dangerous. Griselda smiled warmly at Zenovia. Zenovia. Let me be the decider of that. Besides, if he really was dangerous, do you think he would try to avoid fighting you someone who has seen him falling through a portal and was clearly a witness? Zenovia hesitantly nodded. She understood where Griselda was coming from. Yet for some reason, she felt uncomfortable in his presence. The moment she had laid her eyes on him, she felt a really warm and soothing feeling course through her. As though she were gazing at a thousand suns, each one blazing brightly on her and filling her with warmth. Zenovia. Please be a deer and carry him inside. Griselda said. And Irina, please help her take him to the healers. Zenovia groaned pitifully while Irina nodded. Zenovia and Irina then proceeded to heft the blonde boy from both his sides and started carrying him towards the church, which was only a kilometer away from them. Griselda watched the two carry the boy with them until they disappeared through the tree line. She then raised her head and stared narrow-eyed at the blue sky above the clearing where the portal had appeared. What was that before the boy appeared through the portal? That menacing voice. It must have been carried throughout the city with how loud it was. I need to contact her and consult her opinion on this matter. Oh, the guardians of heaven who look upon us and care for us, I would like to extend my thanks to you for your kindness and would request you to look upon the young as you always do. Please rest assured, the situation is in control for now, and I will let you know if anything comes up. She prayed, her hands joined and her eyes closed. With that, she started walking out of the clearing trying to decide how to proceed from here. She knew taking in someone they did not know about, especially someone who had dropped through a portal was not a smart decision. But being a woman of faith, she could not just leave someone to die. It would be wrong of her to do so. Not to mention that she felt strangely at ease around him, which was unusual because she had never felt that way about anyone before. She saw an unusual yet pleasant aura flowing from him, as if asking her to grasp for him for protection. This boy, Naruto Uzumaki, was someone to keep an eye on. Nighttime, Vatican City. Griselda Corda was one of the most accomplished exorcists and currently the strongest woman in the church's forces. She had joined the church's forces at the age of 16 like everyone else, and since then she had gone on to achieve many accomplishments and earned herself the title of the strongest woman. She was an accomplished sword user and was a natural-born holy sword user herself. After years of faithful service, she had been allowed to leave the active forces and was asked to train future candidates for natural-born holy sword users. Over the years she had trained many students who had gone on and made a name for themselves in the supernatural world. She was extremely proud of them. She was also one of the few people who had a direct connection to heaven, having caught the eyes of Archangel Gabriel for her kind, compassionate and indiscriminate behavior towards everyone, irrespective of them being angels, fallen angels or devils. Currently, she was sitting in the empty praying hall of St. Peter's Basilica. She had visited the boy just before coming here. It seemed the boy's condition was stable once again, but the boy had yet to wake up. She had seen the report which had left her amazed and in no small amounts of awe. The report on the boy was exactly why she was currently sitting in an empty St. Peter's Basilica. She closed her eyes and joined her hands. Oh, the messenger of God, I ask thee for an audience, she said a short prayer and waited. 
Soon enough, the flapping of wings from the altar reached her ears, and the footsteps of someone walking down gracefully echoed throughout the hall. A moment later, Griselda felt someone sit in the seat beside her. A very good evening to you Archangel Gabriel. Griselda greeted. A very good evening to you too, Sister Griselda. A soft and melodious voice replied from beside her. Griselda opened her eyes and turned her head to the side. There beside her sat what may be described as the pinnacle of human beauty. Yet she was anything but human. The woman sitting beside her was wearing a blue and white tunic with gold embroidery. She had dull blonde hair and crystal blue eyes just like her. Her face was adorned with a peaceful look and a gentle smile. Sister Griselda, may I inquire why you asked for an audience from me? It is quite intriguing seeing as you hardly ever ask for an audience. Gabriel said in her gentle tone. Lady Gabriel, are you aware of the incident from this morning? Griselda asked, looking at the archangel. Um now, Griselda, I ask you to drop those titles from my name. It makes me feel old. I am just giving respect where it should be given, Melody. Gabriel let out a small chuckle. As for the incident from this morning. How could I not? It caused quite the stir in heaven. Michael had to send out a lot of angels down to earth to wipe the memories of that voice from the human minds. She then gave Griselda a small smile. It was a good thing you prayed and informed us that everything was okay. Michael was about to send a whole troop of angels to capture the boy. Lady Gabriel, may I ask what that sound from earlier was? Hmm. You may, Griselda. As for the voice. We archangels do have an idea, but we can't confirm it yet. I see. So, I am wondering. You must have asked for my audience regarding the young man. Yes, I did indeed. Then what is plaguing your mind, Griselda? It's just Griselda stopped for a moment before continuing, there is something about the boy. Gabriel eyes Griselda curiously. Does he make you uncomfortable? Maybe even anxious. No, it's not that. Then what is it? It's just Griselda hesitated before she continued, it's just that I feel way too comfortable near him. Kind of like when I am with you Lady Gabriel. Now, it piqued Gabriel's interest. My, is that so? Griselda nodded her head. I am quite sure even Zenovia felt too comfortable around him. That could be the only excuse for her brash behavior. Gabriel hummed in thought. Hmm. Well, Griselda, it seems we do indeed need to keep an eye on the boy. Lady Gabriel, I have no idea how to proceed from here. For a moment, when I saw the boy cough out blood, I had actually thought of leaving him there. It would have been easy and less hectic, but it did not feel right. So, I brought him in and sent him to our healers to be healed. Griselda, you did the right thing. After all, if we, the church would not help someone in need, then who would? And maybe, your act of kindness might end up becoming a boon for us in heaven. Griselda bowed her head, thankfully. I thank you Lady Gabriel for reassuring me of my decision. Gabriel chuckled melodiously. Think not of it, Griselda. She then stood up. I think I should return to heaven to report to my brother and return when the boy has woken up. Just then, the door to the chapel burst open. Gabriel, reacting immediately, snapped her fingers and cast an invisibility illusion over her. Through the door, a young nun came rushing in. Sister Griselda. Sister Griselda. What is it Sister Amanda? The young nun stopped in front of Griselda as she panted. Though the boy he is awake. Griselda was surprised by how quickly the boy seemed to have recovered. She gave the young nun a nod. All right. You can leave, sister. I will visit the boy in a minute. The nun bowed her head before walking out of the chapel, closing its door behind her. The moment she left, Gabriel dropped her invisibility and smiled curiously at Griselda. Well, that was quick. Griselda released a sigh. Indeed. That was the other thing I wanted to inform you about Lady Gabriel. Oh, and what is it? The boy. He seems to have some form of regenerative power within him. According to reports, his organ system had gone through something drastic and by all means, he should have died due to multi-organ failure. But instead, his organs were healing at a rapid pace. Griselda paused for a bit before continuing. And what amazes me, even more, is that his organs were already destroyed before he fought Zenovia and Arena. It just goes on to show how durable the boy is. Gabriel gained a curious frown on her face. Interesting. There are only a few sacred gears that grant such an unnatural regenerative power. But that does not make any sense that he just ignores an injury at that level. By all means, if his body had not given out, he would have likely never realized just how damaged his own body is. Indeed. That was not the only thing Lady Gabriel. Wait. There is more. Yes. When he was resting, our healers decided to run an energy scan on his body to find if there is some residual energy residing in his body causing him harm. Instead, they found something else entirely. The boy's body has weird energy flowing through it in the form of coils. The energy seems similar to Yaokai's chakra, but at the same time, it is not. I see. Did our healers figure out what the difference is between them? No. Unfortunately, our healers were not able to pinpoint any reason as to why the two energies seem so similar yet so different at the same time. 
Curious. Very curious. Not to mention, there seems to be an infinite amount of the same energy flowing through him. Gabriel's eyes widened in surprise. Okay. All of these are a lot to take in. Maybe we should go and meet the young man and see if he can answer some of our questions. All right, as you say Lady Gabriel. Very well, Griselda. Lead the way. Basilica of Saint Mary Major. Once again, Naruto found himself groggily waking up. He tried to blink his eyes to get rid of the bleariness in them. He tried to rub his eyes with his arm, but they felt heavy, as if a load had been placed on them. Unlike last time when he had woken up rejuvenated, this time he felt oddly fatigued. As if he had been running for days which was technically right, if one were to ignore the amount of time he was in a coma in that void. What happened? The last thing I remember was talking to that nice blonde lady, and then coughing out blood. Naruto thought as he looked at the painted ceiling of wherever he was at the moment. He slowly raised his upper body before leaning against the headboard of the bed. As his mind went back to the way he had started coughing. What was that all about? Why did I cough out blood like that? Was it because I ate Kagaya's fruit? His right hand came up as he tried to rub his forehead when he realized that his forehead protector was not there. He anxiously searched in every direction for one of the few valuable objects he had left with himself. But he could not see his forehead protector anywhere. Ah. Good, you're finally up. Naruto turned his eyes towards the door of the room, where he found two women standing. One looked young while the other had to be in her late twenties. Both the women seemed to be dressed in the same outfit as the woman from the clearing he had met before he lost consciousness again. The older woman then turned towards the younger one and said something to her which was inaudible to Naruto. The young woman nodded and ran out of the room. The older woman then turned towards Naruto and started walking towards him. As she walked towards him, Naruto took a moment to get a perfect image of the woman. She had dark black hair with a heart-like face. She wore red-rimmed glasses, behind which were forest green eyes. She had a curvy body which was accentuated by her robes. Her face held a stoic look. Had fun staring at me, boy. Naruto was brought out of his daze by her stern voice. He looked at the woman and blushed lightly as he noticed her giving him an amused look. Um I am extremely sorry. I did not want to stare. Relax, child. I was just kidding you. The woman said, and Naruto released a sigh of relief. You must be wondering where you are. Currently, you're in the healer ward of Basilica of Saint Major Mary. And I am the head healer. You can call me Sister Amelia. Um? Okay. But have you seen my forehead protector? Amelia raised a curious eyebrow indicating that she had no idea what he was talking about. I mean you know the headband I was wearing earlier. Amelia's eyes lit with recognition. She turned around and walked up to the table on the furthest wall. She picked up something and walked back towards him. She then handed the item to Naruto, and much to Naruto's happiness, it was his forehead protector. I guess we made the right decision to keep this rather than toss it away. I am so glad you did. Naruto said staring at the headband on his lap with a fond look. Amelia gave Naruto a pitiful look before walking around his bed and picking up the clipboard attached to the footboard of the bed. You were broad and heavily injured. We found most of your organs damaged beyond repair and by all means, you should have died. Um thanks. Yet you live. So, tell me, child, what in God's name did you go through that caused such damage to your body? Amelia asked, giving Naruto a narrow-eyed look. Uh, I guess I went through some tough stuff. Naruto answered as he scratched the back of his head sheepishly. You think you're cheeky, don't you, brat? Naruto laughed awkwardly. Believe me, even if I told you, you would not believe me. The woman stared at him for a moment before continuing. All right, no need to tell me. Though I must say, I am impressed with your regenerative abilities. I haven't seen such regeneration ever. Thanks. Amelia sighed before putting the clipboard down. She then gave Naruto another stern stare as she said, I have informed the one who brought you in. She should be arriving any moment. You mean Griselda? Amelia began eyeing him like he was dirt beneath her feet. Well you are here, you shall refer to her as either Griselda Sama or Sister Griselda. Is that understood? Why yes. All right. Naruto replied shakily. Damn, what's wrong with these ladies? They are scary. Though Griselda seems like someone everyone respects. Anyway, I don't care what Sister Griselda of all people wants with you, but let me warn you here and now. If you do something to harm her, you will find the whole church's forces after you, understand? Naruto gulped, but before he could answer, another voice interrupted him from the door. Why, thank you Amelia, for your kind words, but I think even I don't deserve such praise. Amelia stiffened. Naruto stared past the woman, and found the woman from earlier, Griselda, standing at the door. However, he could feel another presence beside her, though whoever it was was invisible to either Naruto or Amelia. Griselda began walking towards them. Amelia bowed in respect. Sister Griselda. I was just stating what is true. Griselda gave Amelia a gentle smile. Thank you Amelia. But now I have to request you to leave. I have some important things to talk about with Naruto here. Amelia gave a bow. 
Of course, sister. She gave Naruto a warning look before gracefully walking out of the room. Griselda watched Amelia leave with a smile on her face. As the black-haired woman left the room, Griselda turned towards Naruto and addressed him. Please forgive her. She is quite protective when it comes to her friends. Naruto chuckled good-naturedly. It's quite alright. I can understand how she feels. Griselda smiled gratefully. I am quite sure you can. Say Yuzumaki-san, you would not mind meeting an old acquaintance of mine, would you? Naruto blinked a bit before smiling. No, not even a bit. I mean you did help me and this is the least I can do for you. And please call me Naruto. Yuzumaki-san makes me feel old. I guess you heard him, Gabriel-sama. Suddenly, out of thin air, a figure appeared beside Griselda, and Naruto's cheeks reddened as his eyes laid on the female figure in front of him. Griselda was a beautiful woman, but even she did not hold a candle in front of this woman. What the hell is wrong with this world? Are all women here this beautiful? The woman standing beside Griselda was just as blonde as him and had azure blue eyes like his. She had a serene look on her face. Her face held an innocent look and she had a bustier figure than Griselda. And what the heck is wrong with that? Naruto thought as he discreetly eyed Gabriel's bountiful chest. Each one of these ladies seemed to have a chest size similar to that of Tsunade's. He shook his head trying to get such thoughts out of his head. Damn it. Get out of my head pervy sage. Naruto-san, meet Gabriel-sama. Griselda introduced. She's been looking forward to meeting you. Gabriel gave Naruto a smile that only made him blush harder. One of her dainty hands came up and gently laid above her chest, right above her heart. A very good evening, Yuzumaki-san. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. Chapter 3 Information Archangel Gabriel, the messenger of God, the most beautiful woman in heaven, had lived for millennia now. She could proudly say that she had seen and experienced everything there was to see and experience for an angel of her station. From their initial reliance on them to their current independence, she had witnessed the entire evolution of humanity. She had seen humans go from hunting to inventing, so much so that some of their inventions had even surprised the angels up in heaven. She had seen humans discover fire, and from there, the evolution of humanity had started. Since then, humans had come a long way. Not only in terms of technology, but also in terms of their strength and weaknesses. Humans had never been a perfect creature. They were neither peace-loving like the angels nor driven by the seven deadly sins like the devils. They had always been somewhere in between. That is what her father said about humans, what he liked so much about humanity. Her father always liked to point out that unlike them or the devils, humans were not inclined to follow only one way. Rather, they could do as they desired and choose their own way. Thousands of years ago, she had seen humans wage war on themselves for mere land and disagreements. In that, humans did not differ much from angels or devils. She had seen humans commit atrocities of the most heinous kinds, some that would even make the devil lords puke in disgust. Yet, every time she asked her father he would calmly say, Gabriel, give them a chance. And she gave them. Unlike her brothers, who had run out of patience and only looked after the humans because of their father. And then, he was born. Dot. Jesus of Nazareth. Someone, her father proclaimed to be special. Proclaimed to be his son. At first, she was wary. Believing that once he would grow up, he would change corrupted by this already corrupted world. But the change never came. The tiny matchstick that lightened a small room had developed into a blazing sun that would radiate its warmth for those who desired it. The people beset by sorrow and misery flocked to him like moths to a flame as he became a beacon in the darkness that enveloped this world. He preached about love and peace. Preached about friendship and comradeship. And wanted to create a world with no war and hatred. He became her father's most vocal supporter and became his messenger. God was quite proud of his son's generosity, kindness and caring nature. Jesus had surpassed all of God's expectations and then some more. However, he was betrayed by his own people. Tried and then crucified and left to die from hunger and pain. God was infuriated with the humans and was about to deliver the most severe divine punishments when Jesus's last wish before his death reached God's ears. O oh Father, forgive them of their sin, for they do not know what they do. That one sentence alone had rattled the entire heaven. Even in his last breath, even when he was betrayed by his own people, Jesus refused to be affected by resentment or vengeance. Moved by his compassion and forgiving nature, her father decided to ascend Jesus to heaven as an angel who would guard the door to all souls in heaven and judge the souls accordingly. And thus, with his death, the beacon that shined so brightly was snubbed forever. The followers of Jesus went on and created the Christian faction. And while her father did not have much influence before that, Jesus's death and ascension marked the beginning of their influence on humanity. However, since Jesus' death, no other was born like him. There were some who had a compassionate soul, but none shone as bright as him. And soon, the world once again plunged into darkness. And then a few centuries later, her father had left the realm of the mortals at the end of the Second War of Heaven, fought between the angels, devils and the newly formed army of fallen angels. 
Her father's death had caused an imbalance in the world. And soon, the world was overtaken by war, strife and struggle. The two world wars fraught on this planet had to be the two most devastating results of the imbalance caused by the god's death. Something she knew, the other factions must have noticed no matter how hard they tried to hide the death of her father. But that was before she had entered the room where the intruder was being kept. The moment she stepped inside the room with Griselda, she was burst with the same feeling she had when she had met Jesus. The same aura. She realized just how true Griselda was when the latter stated that staring at him was like basking in the glow of a thousand suns. Because that was the exact same feeling she was currently feeling. It shocked her how bright the aura of the human was. By all means, he seemed like an archangel, yet she could not find a shred of light energy within him, but a different form of energy filled his body. In contrast to Jesus, who was a demigod, she felt something different about the blonde-haired boy staring in confusion at the two nuns. She could sense power within him, power that he seemed to be keeping suppressed at the moment. And it was that power that interested her. It piqued her curiosity. How could a human possess an energy so similar to the Yao case, yet so different? How could she sense an endless ocean of power within him? How could a human feel so similar to Jesus, yet so different? In her curiosity, she had completely missed the exit of the other nun and had nearly missed Griselda calling her out. It had taken all the experience she had gathered over the years to pull herself out of the trance she found herself in. But the invisibility spell now undone, she stood in front of him. Though she did not reveal her angel side to him yet. A very good evening Mr. Yuzumaki. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. She said with a smile. Her smile widened as she saw the young man blush lightly, though it was a surprise that he was not drooling like all the other males she had come in contact with. Naruto shook his head to recollect himself and gave a smile in return. Hello. It's nice to meet you too. And please call me Naruto. For the blonde ninja, the moment the blonde woman, Griselda if he remembered correctly, had entered the room he could feel there was someone standing beside her. And just as he had predicted, as soon as Griselda called out the woman's name, whoever it was dropped the invisibility from her and stood in front of him. Gabriel, that's what Griselda said if he heard her right. Naruto tried to grab a feel of her aura, and he was surprised by the amount of power he felt from within her, power that she was definitely keeping suppressed just like him. He guessed that just like him, Gabriel did not want to frighten the opposite party with a display of power. However, what actually confused him was the weird energy signature that he could sense from within this woman. It was nothing like Chakra. It did resonate a little with his six-path sage mode Chakra, but even that similarity was tiny. He made a note to investigate this energy later when he could get out of this bed. For now, he decided to remain patient and see how things go. He was not trying to come off as a threat or offend them. That was Sasuke's job. But if he felt for one moment that they were a danger to his life, he would make a run for it. And if the two blonde ladies tried to stop him oh well, he could always knock them out and get away. Naruto. Gabriel began, her voice curious. If you don't mind, may we ask how you ended up here? Naruto blinked and scratched his chin. Well, it's a long story. Gabriel smiled. Well, it's good that we have time then. Naruto frowned before saying, uh. It was actually a giant red lizard that kind of sent me flying here. Griselda blinked in confusion. Giant red lizard. Naruto nodded his head frantically. Yeah, I know right. I mean, he had red metal-like skin, four giant wings and claws. Griselda and Gabriel both felt sweat trickle down their brow. They felt like they had an idea who he was talking about. Naruto, can you tell us about your encounter with this lizard? Gabriel asked. Naruto scratched his chin in thought. His encounter with the fearsome dragon was not of much importance anyway, at least for him. So, he did not see any harm in sharing his encounter with the Great Reed with these ladies. He tried to recollect all the memories from the void before starting to recount his tell. Flashback, he had tried swimming his way through the void towards the creature and had traveled a good distance when he had remembered that he could actually fly. But the sweat drop he decided to use one of his many abilities, that was to fly, to reach the creature. It was only then that he realized how true he was when he compared the creature to Kurama's size. The lizard was huge. Though compared to the size of the ten tails, even the lizard did not seem to hold a candle. Whoa. You are huge. Naruto exclaimed in awe. The creature seemed to have heard him as it stopped whatever it was doing and turned to face him. At that moment, Naruto felt like an insignificant ant in front of the lizard. Haha. I am huge, aren't I? Praise me more, puny creature. The lizard boasted with a haughty look. Haha. <laughs> yeah. I mean you have to be one of the largest creatures I have seen. Hey, can you tell me where I am, right now? You are in the dimensional gap. My home. The giant lizard laughed haughtily before looking down curiously at Naruto. Interesting. So, who are you? Naruto smiled cheekily. Hey. Isn't it proper to introduce yourself first before asking someone's name? The red creature looked at him for a moment before bursting out laughing. I like you, hatchling. You have got guts. 
He then gave a smirk. But you see, I don't give my name to just anyone. But seeing as you interest me, if you answer my questions, I may give you my name. Naruto got a miffed look on his face. What? That's so unfair, but oh well, I do need your help. So, as I asked before, who are you? I am Naruto Uzumaki. Nice to meet you. And what are you, Naruto Uzumaki? At that question, Naruto stared at the giant lizard in confusion. Um what I am. I think human. Um you see Naruto, I don't like when someone lies to me. Naruto's eyes widened. Huh. But I am telling the truth. I am a human well, I mean I am a ninja, but I am a human. Ninja? Human? Are you kidding me, hatchling? I know for a fact that there are literally no humans who can survive the dimension gap. Even amongst the supernatural world that I guard, only a few can't survive the harsh nature of the dimensional gap, and even then, they would need some form of magic to survive. But you don't seem to be using any spell. Naruto blinked in confusion. I have absolutely no idea what you just said. But believe me, I am a human. The giant lizard frowned as it narrowed its large eyes at Naruto. Hmm. But now that I try to sense it, I can feel a very familiar power within you, but I can't figure out what. Um can you point a way out of this place? The giant lizard ignored his question as he pondered to himself until his eyes widened slightly, as if remembering something he had long forgotten. You're one of them, aren't you? Naruto once again found himself staring in confusion at the giant red lizard. What? The red lizard narrowed its eyes as it began hovering around Naruto, as if trying to gauge its prey. At first, I was unable to grasp what that force inside of you was. But now I am sure where I had sensed it. Naruto felt sweat trickle down his forehead. I seriously have no idea what you're talking about. Don't lie to me, filthy parasite. The giant lizard roared. I know of your kind. You are nothing but leeches trying to survive off of a planet's life force. No, no, no. Wait. I am telling the truth. I don't know what you're talking about. I am not one of them. He must be talking about the Utsutsukis that Kagaya mentioned. What the hell is going on here? The giant lizard backed up a bit and looking at Naruto with narrowed eyes, filled with suspicion. You seriously don't have any idea, do you? No, no. I don't. The creature hummed. Interesting. I don't know how you have no idea of who you are. Maybe you lost your memories or something. Naruto's eyebrow twitched in annoyance. No, damn it. I haven't lost my memories or anything. I just don't know who these parasites are. The creature gave Naruto a skeptically. I see I don't care. But believe me, if you try to go after the relic in this world, I will come kill you personally. Naruto gulped before nodding. Of course. Now, go. That portal should take you to my world. But before Great Red could open a portal, Naruto interrupted him. Hey, you haven't introduced yourself yet. My guess I can tell you. I am the Great Red the True Dragon, the Dragon of Dreams, the God of Dreams, the True Red Dragon. Naruto's eyes widened in amazement. Whoa. You're a real dragon. Great Red smirked. Heh, that I am, hatchling. Hey, hey. Can I ask you another question? Um, I usually don't allow it, but let's see what you have to ask. These parasites you talked about. Can you tell me something about them? Great Red seemed to contemplate what he wanted to say. So, you seriously have no idea, huh? I guess I can tell you. But these days, they are pretty much a shadow of their glorious days. Shadow of their glorious days Naruto thought as he felt a sweat trickle down his brow. Does he mean it's Sutsukus like a guy are weak? There was a time when those fucking parasites used to terrorize universes and whatnot. I remember how their leaders assigned their soldiers to hunt down dragon gods like me to keep them as pets. Fuckers, if I could find one of them alive, I would tear them to pieces. They had leaders. Naruto asked apprehensively. What the hell? Did it Sutsukus really hunt down dragons like this guy? Just how strong were they supposed to be? Ah yes, they're leaders. Bastards. All of them. If only I could get a hand on one of those motherfuckers, I would torture them for eternity. Naruto whistled in amazement. Man, you really hate them, don't you? Hate them bah. That's a really nice way to put how I feel about those scumbags. Naruto sweat dropped at his words. So, anyway. How many of them were there? Who? The leaders. If I remember correctly, a dozen of them. W what? D dozen of them? Naruto said, as apprehension sat it. Great Red shrugged or that was what Naruto thought he did anyway. Yes, might have been more. But fortunately, they are not alive anymore. Good riddance, if you ask me. Oh oh, that's good. Yeah, at least I don't have to worry about a dozen of overpowered beings coming after my ass. But what happened to them? Or? A fight that nearly destroyed our universe with a few others. I see Naruto said, not knowing whether to be frightened or relieved. It's a good thing that the remnants of those fuckers are nothing more than pests now. If Kagaya is like a pest to him, I don't think I want to fight him ever. Naruto thought with a sweat drop. Heh, I guess it's a good thing that I am not one of them, huh? Naruto said scratching the back of his neck. Indeed. 
Otherwise, I would have killed you by now. Great Red spoke in such a relaxed manner that sounded like he was mentioning the weather. Naruto gulped at that. I guess I should leave right now. Hmm. Oh yes, you would need a portal to leave. He then flicked his finger, and a purple portal appeared behind Naruto. Naruto stared at the portal skeptically. This portal is not going to turn me into puss if I pass through it, right? Great Red burst out into fits of laughter. Don't kid me brat. For a being of my caliber to make such a mistake, it is unacceptable. He announced proudly. I guess it is safe for me then. Naruto said to himself, eyeing the portal once again. Yes, yes. It is completely safe. You should go now, brat. I have far more important things to do. That made Naruto chuckle, but he quickly tried to control it. Alas, it was too late. What, for the sake of office's tits, are you laughing at brat? Naruto shook his head frantically. No, no. It's nothing, really. Great Red narrowed his eyes at the blonde-haired boy that was turning into a menace in his eyes quite quickly. You know brat, I don't like it when people hide something from me. Naruto chuckled and rubbed the back of his head. It's just that I once knew a giant fox who was always grumpy and filled with hatred. But turns out, he was just a giant mushy fox. And you kind of remind me of him. A giant mushy lizard. Great Red, however, did not take his comment lightly. Fox mushy lizard. Great Red roared with a roar that unleashed a massive gust of wind towards Naruto. You foolish brat. Don't show me your face if you don't want to die. Whoa. Naruto exclaimed as he flew backwards and out of the portal, which immediately closed off. Great Red huffed in exasperation but looked on in interest at the spot where Naruto had disappeared. Naruto Uzumaki, huh? What an interesting creature you are. I might as well keep a close eye on you. Flashback end. And that's how I ended up here. Naruto said finishing his tale. Though he decided to omit all the details about the discussion he had about the Itsutsukas, it was then that he noticed that both Gabriel and Griselda were staring at him wide-eyed and open-mouthed. Their faces held a combination of awe, surprise and disbelief, though he had not mentioned the Utsutsuki thing the dragon had said. Gabriel inhaled sharply. So, let me get this straight Naruto. You were inside the dimension gap where you met the Great Red. Yes. And then, you had a conversation with him. Aha. Uh -huh. And then, you called him a mushy lizard. Yes. But now that I think about it, it may not have been the right thing to say. And then, he threw you out of that portal. Yup. Gabriel released a sigh. At least you are alive somehow. That in itself is saying something. Gabriel pinched the bridge of her nose. I need a nice sleep after this. She said. Naruto, do you have any idea what you have done? I may have angered the wrong creature. Gabriel's smile was tight. You have no idea, Naruto. It is a good thing that he is not here, trying to kill you. It would have surely destroyed our planet otherwise. Gabriel's statement made Naruto gulp. Great Red it actually reminded Naruto a lot of the Ten Tails. The only difference being the Ten Tails was a mindless beast, whereas Great Red was intelligent. This simple fact made Great Red far more dangerous than the Ten Tails. That much was clear to Naruto. Say, Naruto. Naruto blinked and said, yes. Would you mind telling me what you are? Gabriel asked. Naruto deadpanned at Gabriel. You too. Gabriel smiled and said, well, you see, Great Red was not wrong when he said that no human can survive the dimensional gap. Yet, here you are, proclaiming to be a human, who has spent who knows how long in the dimensional gap. I am sorry to say this, Naruto, but that in itself is unbelievable. Naruto's face turned painful. Something then clicked in his mind. Wait. You actually believe me about the giant lizard? There is not much we can do but believe you, for now. But if what you said was true, then it is really lucky that both you and this planet have not been destroyed already. I am sorry. But I don't know what to say, lady. All I know is that I am a human. Gabriel shook her head. From the corner of her eyes, she noticed Griselda had completely frozen. Most probably trying to process all that Naruto had said. She turned towards the bright blonde-haired boy. Naruto, how did you even end up in the dimensional void? That question caused Naruto's expression to turn melancholic. It brought back memories that he did not want to deal with yet. There was a situation back home that made me take some drastic measures to solve. Hence, why I was there. Gabriel noticed the depressed expression on the young man's face and smiled lightly. I am sorry if it brought back some unwanted memories. This young man. To end up this way, he must have endured some incredibly terrible experiences. Naruto smiled softly at her. No, no. It's alright. I understand you're curious how I ended up here. Gabriel lied Naruto. It was rare to find young people with even a small amount of understanding as this young man. Yes, I am indeed curious. But I don't want to make it unfair. So, how about I make a deal? Naruto raised an eyebrow at her. A deal? Yes. How about I tell you about this world and in return, you tell me about yours. Does that sound fair? Naruto considered her for a moment before chuckling. Yes, it does. But before that, I have a question. Gabriel raised an eyebrow at that. A question. 
Naruto gave a nod. Yes. How exactly do you know about the dimensional gap and about the giant lizard? I guess you can say both of these are quite common amongst the supernatural beings. Supernatural beings. You will understand once I explain to you about our world. Oh. Okay. Well, then I guess I should begin. Naruto, this world by no means is an ordinary one. Naruto chuckled at that. I noticed that much when those two girls pounced on me. I mean, my world had some weird swords too. So, I guess I should not have been that surprised. Gabriel smiled a little. I guess, some things are quite common between our worlds. But tell me Naruto, does your world have gods, devils and dragons? Naruto's eyes widened. I see, Gabriel muttered before saying, well you see Naruto our world seems to be a little different from yours. You see, in our world there exists gods, devils, fallen angels, angels and dragons. And these beings together form the supernatural world. For the next couple of hours, Gabriel explained everything about their world in a brief and easier to follow manner. She explained to him about the existence of gods, the different pantheons, the existence of angels, devils and fallen angels, the treaties between various factions and pantheons, and finally the humans and how they were kept negligent of the existence of the supernatural world for their own safety. She did omit her father's death though, after all it was not something to be shared with anyone. She explained to him that the building he was currently residing in was called a church, and explained to him some of the basic principles of Christianity. And as Gabriel explained each and everything to Naruto, the blonde-haired boy did his best to keep up with her. But only managed to understand only a few things which mostly consisted of this world has gods, dragons and devils and they are powerful. Don't get him wrong, he had never been good in retaining knowledge. That was not his specialty anyway. While Gabriel was explaining these things to Naruto, Griselda had managed to come out of her stance and had left to bring some snacks for the discussing pair. She had returned by the time Gabriel had finished explaining her world. After Gabriel finished her explanation, it was time for Naruto to explain about his world. After pondering for a moment, he decided to explain about the ninja system and his world and how one became ninjas, the five major ninja nations and smaller ninja villages, he explained in brief about the wars in his world, though he decided to omit the fourth ninja war for obvious reasons. He had also omitted mentioning the Itsutsukis, Hagoromo and some other things that he did not feel safe to explain. By the end, both Gabriel and Griselda seemed to be in deep thought. It seems your world is quite interesting, Naruto, Gabriel said. A child soldier's lady Gabriel. Does not that seem excessive? Griselda chimed in. Child soldiers? Naruto asked in confusion. They each their own, Gabriel muttered with a frown. Seemed like she too was displeased with the idea of child soldiers. We can't change what they do in their world Griselda. Of course, Milady. Anyways, Gabriel said standing up, we have stayed here for far too long, Naruto. It would be best to leave, so that you can take some rest. Rest? Naruto asked in panic. Wait. Are you suggesting that I stay in this bed for for who knows how long? Griselda narrowed her eyes at Naruto. Yes, yes you will. She said in a commanding voice. E but, you can't do that. I will just escape from here. Naruto protested. Griselda put her arms on her hips and smiled a very sweet smile. I am telling you to stay put here until you have recovered completely. Am I understood? Naruto felt a shiver run down his spine. Griselda right now was not the sweet angelic woman he had met. Instead, she reminded him too much of Granny Tsunade when the latter went full mother hen mode on him. Her face held an expression that promised thousand years of pain if he disagreed with her. So, just like with Tsunade, he nodded his head in acceptance. He could always escape when no one was there. Griselda's face returned to her normal angelic self, and she smiled kindly at Naruto. Gabriel smiled at the duo, happy that they were getting close. She had a feeling that Griselda would play a very major role in Naruto's path. Though she had no justification for that just yet. Griselda, Gabriel called out, it seems we must leave now. Griselda bowed her head. All right, Milady. Gabriel gave the blonde a bright smile that brought a smile on the latter's face. Rest for now Naruto. Griselda will come to meet you tomorrow. And with that the two blondes walked out of the hospital room. With their exit, two more nuns entered to take care of Naruto. Once both Gabriel and Griselda were out of the hospital room, they made their way to Griselda's quarters. Once there, Griselda turned towards Gabriel. How should we proceed from here Milady? Griselda asked. Gabriel hummed while she deliberated. For now, it would be best if we keep the boy close to us. She spoke. Griselda tensed, her brows furrowing. Do you think he might be a threat to us? Hmm. Not really. Gabriel said. But there is something about him that intrigues me. Not to mention, my brothers would want him observed at least until they are satisfied that he is not a threat. I see. Griselda nodded her head. So we let him stay here for the time being. To decide what to do with the young man, I will need to talk about the matter with my brothers in more detail. Gabriel then turned towards Griselda. Until then, I want you to look after him Griselda. Can you do that for me? Me? 
Why me, Milady? If not you, then who Griselda? Who is more suitable for this job if not you? You have the experience in both battle and dealing with teenagers. So, yes. To me you are the best option. Alright, I will do it. Griselda said bowing her head in reverence. Gabriel smiled at Griselda and disappeared in a burst of white feathers. Just as Gabriel left, Griselda released a sigh and thought to herself, what did I get myself into? In a whirlwind of white feathers, Gabriel appeared in front of a large silver gate with golden patterns on it. High above there was a white ceiling. Behind Gabriel there were fountains, plants and trees. The place looked heavenly. But it was something that Gabriel had become familiar with over the years. This was the sixth heaven. The place where Cirrus like her and her brothers resided. And where they met occasionally to discuss current affairs and how to govern heaven more effectively. She started walking towards the gigantic doors, and as she approached near it, the doors slowly swung open without any assistance allowing Gabriel to walk inside. The interior of the sixth heaven was even more beautiful than the exterior. Covered in snow-like cloud and a warm feeling. Trees and plants on the sides with a wide illuminated ceiling, supported by just as wide and gold pillars. On the sides, there were several doors that led to the individual rooms of each seraph, and also to other rooms like libraries and such. But currently, her destination was the meeting room located right in front of her. Approaching the door, she opened it and stepped inside. The interior of the room was exactly as similar to what was outside. White ceilings and walls with golden patterns. However, at the center of the room was a round table with a red top, and four golden chairs separated at equal distances from each other. She slowly walked towards the only empty chair and sat down in it, while looking at the other occupants of the table. There sitting right across her was her oldest living brother Michael. On her right was Uriel and on her left was Raphael. The good evening sister. Michael greeted in his usual deep yet kind tone. Uriel and Raphael nodded their heads. Good evening to you two brothers. Gabriel greeted in return. So, what is the situation on earth? Uriel asked. Well he was known as one of the most patient angels in heaven, when something piqued his interest, he could become quite impatient. Hum now, brother, Raphael interrupted, Gabriel just arrived. Let her breathe. The faster we solve this issue, the better for us. Uriel countered with a serious face. We are already in a precarious situation thanks to so many unfortunate circumstances. We are not in a position to make delays regarding such dangerous issues. Michael released a sigh. Raphael, as much as I would like to agree with you, Uriel has a point. We need to resolve this issue as soon as possible. He then looked at his sister. Gabriel, please forgive me, but I would need you to give us a brief overview of the situation on Earth. Gabriel smiled and said, no need to apologize brother. But the situation on Earth is quite confusing but at the same time very interesting. Uriel raised an eyebrow in interest. What do you mean Gabriel? I am quite sure you remember our sensors picked a weird energy signature enter the Earth's atmosphere out of nowhere, right? Gabriel paused for her brothers who nodded their heads. Gabriel then continued. It seems the energy signature belongs to a young man. A young man, you say? Raphael repeated after her. Yes, a young man. Gabriel replied. And what was this young man you are talking about Gabriel? Uriel asked in a serious tone. Was he a devil? A fallen angel? Or someone associated with some other pantheon? Quite the contrary actually. What do you mean? Get to it straight, Gabriel. Uriel said in a frustrated tone. The young man is actually a human. Gabriel said with a smile. Or at least that's what he said, anyway. He is either 17 or 18 years old. His name is Naruto Uzumaki. The whole table went silent. Michael, who had joined his hands and was resting his head on the back of his intertwined hands, raised an eyebrow in curiosity. While well, both Uriel and Raphael looked at her in disbelief. And you just believed him? Just like that? Raphael asked in shock. Gabriel shook her head. No. At first, I did not. But you know, I can sense when someone is lying to me. I did not sense any form of lie from him. Not to mention, he does not seem to have any form of connection with the other pantheons. Except, except, Michael repeated. Except, he seemed to have some form of weird energy signature that resembled a little with the Yaukais's chakra. Gabriel replied. Yaukais chakra? Raphael muttered in thought. Could he be a possible spy from the Yaukai faction? Uriel asked. It would not be far from possibility. Especially after the fiasco they had with the devils not many years ago. It would seem perfect to have a spy on every faction. Gabriel frowned and answered. Not possible. As I said, I can detect lies and he did not lie to me. Not to mention, the boy has no idea what the Yao case are either. At least it is what I could conclude from the conversation I had with him. But when did humans start having energy signatures like the Yao case? Uriel asked in disbelief. Not exactly like them, brother. It was similar, yes. But the similarity was very tiny. Gabriel said. Let's just say, we agree that the boy is a human. Michael interrupted. 
Was that loud voice that echoed throughout the city, what we had feared it was. Gabriel nodded slowly. Yes. It was Great Red's voice. Raphael took a sharp breath as did Uriel. Michael seemed to be in deep thought before saying. How did the boy appear over that area Gabriel? Through a portal. Gabriel answered. Opened by Great Red himself. Hmm. Michael hummed in thought. Do you know anything else? Gabriel then proceeded to tell her brothers exactly what Naruto had told her, not leaving anything behind. And as her story progressed, she took some joy seeing the look of disbelief growing on both Uriel and Raphael's faces. Though Michael seemed to tense with each passing moment. When Gabriel ended her tale on how Naruto had met Great Red and his conversation with the latter, Raphael immediately responded. And you want us to believe that this boy you talk about is actually human. Either you have grown naive Gabriel or that boy is obviously lying. Uriel looked at Michael and said, brother, Raphael is right. There is no possible way that this boy is a human. There is no way that he insulted Great Red and returned alive. The boy is obviously lying. Gabriel's brows furrowed in slight anger. I know my capabilities, Raphael, Uriel. And I would say for the umpteenth time that the boy did not lie. No one is doubting you Gabriel, Raphael said with softened eyes, but mistakes can be made by anyone. Not to mention, this boy's tale is too unbelievable to be trusted. Indeed, Uriel said, nodding in agreement. He then looked at Michael who was still in deep thought, brother I suggest we take care of this boy before he becomes a threat to us. He finished with a grave tone. You're going to kill a child, Uriel. Gabriel asked both disgusted at the thought and outraged. Isn't that an overkill? Well unfortunate, Uriel continued, it is the most plausible solution. We know nothing about this boy. We don't know what he is capable of. A small drastic measure now can save us from countless atrocities later. Raphael stayed quiet throughout the exchange with his eyes closed. He was neither agreeing nor disagreeing with Uriel. Killing a child is not a solution to our problems, Uriel. It has never been. I thought we were supposed to be better than that. Gabriel argued, ferocity seeping into her voice with each passing second. Do you think I want this Gabriel? Uriel said, his fists were clenched tightly. Do you think I want the blood of some child on my hands? No Gabriel. But sometimes drastic problems call for drastic solutions. This problem is not as drastic as you are making it out to be, Uriel. Gabriel argued. It may not be drastic now, but it can be in the future. Uriel said, countering Gabriel. But, before Gabriel could argue back, a stern voice interrupted her. Enough. The whole table quietened down. The three arguing siblings turned to look at their oldest of them who was sitting there in the same position since the beginning of the meeting. Why do you argue for this child so much Gabriel? Michael asked. I have never seen you defending someone else so fiercely before. Gabriel hesitated for a moment before confessing her reason. Because because the boy is different. Different? Michael repeated. Different how Gabriel? Gabriel took a deep breath. He reminds me of him, she said with a soft voice, barely louder than a whisper. But her voice was carried to all her brothers in the quiet room. Him? Raphael interjected. Who are you talking about Gabriel? Michael asked calmly. Father, Gabriel replied in a soft tone. There was another swift intake of breath all around the table. She looked up and saw all her brothers staring at her with wide open eyes. In a flash, her oldest brother was beside her and had grabbed her by her shoulders. What did you say Gabriel? Michael asked, his voice desperate and his wide eyes staring at the blonde woman. I said, Gabriel began, he reminds me too much of Father and Jesus. He has the same bright and compassionate aura as both of them. Could it be, Michael muttered in shock. Not possible, Michael, Uriel interjected, breaking Michael out of his musings. Remember Michael, father swore to never have another child with a human after what happened to Jesus. Not to mention, the boy is way too young to be father's child. You are right brother. Michael agreed with a sigh. He turned towards Gabriel. Gabriel, do you trust this boy? Gabriel gave a confident nod. I do, brother. Michael nodded. Very well, we will trust your judgment. He then moved back to his position at the table and looked at all of his siblings. Very well, for now, we observe the boy and his actions. The moment he betrays us, we will take necessary actions against the boy. He then looked straight at Gabriel. What do you suggest we do from here Gabriel? Gabriel stood up and said, for now, I have asked my contact Griselda to keep an eye on him. If you wish, I can instruct her to start educating the child properly about our world and its ways. Maybe have him join our forces for some time. Will he even agree to join our forces? Michael asked skeptically. I do not know. But we can give it a try. If anyone can convince him to work for us, it is Griselda. Gabriel said confidently. Michael hummed in thought. Very well. Have Griselda look after Naruto's education and if he decides to join then have her start his training. He finished. Are you sure about this brother? Uriel asked. Having him join our forces might as well give him the biggest opportunity to spy on us. I do not know if I am right or not, brother. 
I am not father, Michael said, but I will trust Gabriel just like father once did. Also, isn't there that human saying? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Uriel sighed and nodded. Very well brother. I just hope we are not making a mistake this time. But what if he decides not to join us? Raphael asked looking at his siblings. Michael's face hardened. Then we go with plan B. We have a plan B. Uriel asked in confusion. Yes. Michael replied. Plan B is to capture him and imprison him here in heaven until we have decided that he is not a threat. He nodded at his siblings. Let's end the discussion here. We have other things to do. But that the meeting was concluded. Uriel and Raphael got up and exited the room leaving only Michael and Gabriel. Michael started walking towards the door. Just as he was a few feet away from the door, Gabriel spoke up. Is imprisoning him really necessary, brother? Michael stopped in his tracks before saying, I understand that you are quite taken with this boy Gabriel, but the boy has potential, Michael. He can be the new beacon of light this world needs. The beacon of hope and strength that once Jesus was. He could be fat, Gabriel. Michael interfered with a stern voice. Father is dead. And so is Jesus. Humanity has become way too corrupted and you know it too. I know it hurts, but we must face reality. There is and will never be someone like either of them. For yours and that boy's sake, I hope he agrees to join our forces. Otherwise, we can't let him wander around the world freely without making sure he is not a threat not only to us but the world itself. And with that, he walked out of the room leaving Gabriel all alone in the room. The blonde woman sighed in frustration. She just hoped that Naruto would accept their offer and join Heaven's forces. At least until her brothers had confirmed that he was not a threat to Heaven and the world. Three days later. It had been three days since Naruto had met Gabriel, and since then, the blonde ninja was reminded how boring it was to be confined in a hospital. On the very first day, he had tried to escape through the main gate, thinking that no one would know. But alas, Griselda was there, standing outside the hospital door with a sickeningly sweet smile on her face. That day, Naruto received a lump on his head and was confined in the hospital room with the door locked. The next day at midnight, Naruto had tried to escape through the window. He had employed all of his stealth skills that he had developed while running away from Chunin's and sometimes Anbu members. But alas, Griselda was there in the garden that the window looked over. That day Naruto received two lumps on his head and was confined to the hospital bed with chains wrapped everywhere on his body. While chained, Naruto cursed whatever deity up there for torturing him like this. Though he never stopped wondering how Griselda found out that he was escaping. Was that her superpower? To find out when someone was breaking free of her control. Or was it just pure luck? But he did not need to suffer anymore as the very next day, Griselda had come into his room with Amanda, who then informed him that he was allowed to leave. Oh, how happy he had been. He had jumped in joy for 15 minutes straight that he could leave this terrible confinement. Currently, Naruto was being led by Griselda to somewhere he had no idea about. As he was walking by, he noticed that the building, church if he remembered correctly, was majorly filled with female priests. Or were they nuns? Or sisters? Naruto did not care anyway. He could always ask later. Occasionally, he would find some males in the building. But it was really weird to have the females eyeing him and whispering to each other. I mean, if you want to insult someone do it a little more discreetly, Yakno. Naruto wondered depressingly. Seemed like the stairs were not going to leave him in this world either. After climbing three floors, the pair stopped near a fancy door. Griselda brought out a key from her robe's pocket and opened the door, calling Naruto inside. As Naruto entered through the door, he was amazed at what he saw. The room was huge with a very high ceiling. From the center of the ceiling some form of layered furniture was hanging that seemed to glow with light. There was a large bed that seemed like it could easily hold five people in it, in the corner of the room. There was a fancy center table and instruments he had no idea about. There was a bookshelf filled to the brim with books. On the floor there was a fancy carpet. The windows had fancy curtains. Overall, to Naruto, the room seemed like it belonged to some royalty. This used to be a priest's residence, but the priest was transferred to another church, and this room has been empty since. From now on, this room is yours. Wait. Wait. This room is mine. Naruto asked in confusion. Did I say it in Chinese? Griselda asked sarcastically. What? Griselda shook her head exasperatedly. Nothing. And yes, this room is yours from now Naruto. Wow. Naruto exclaimed as he looked around the room. He walked towards the bed and sat on it and was fairly surprised when the cushion sank down a bit. He touched the covers and was amazed by their softness. He had never thought that he would ever get to sleep in such a nice bed in his life. He wondered if even such a luxurious bed was available to the daimyos in his world. He got up and walked towards Griselda who was looking at him with a gentle smile. He rubbed the back of his head and said awkwardly. I I don't know what to say, Griselda. I I never thought I would ever be. It's alright Naruto. Griselda interrupted. You don't need to thank me. It is just a small help from our part. 
At least until you are healed completely. Naruto chuckled and flexed his muscles. Ah. Don't worry Griselda. I am completely fine. I can run a mile if you want. I can leave soon too. Griselda shook her finger. Not so fast Naruto. Remember, Amanda may have released you from the hospital bed. But she's still set to rest for a week at least. To make sure you are healed fully. You do realize I heal almost instantly? I think Amanda informed you that much. Naruto said with a deadpan. Griselda gave a bright smile in return. She did. And I ignored it. You are under my care Naruto. And I want you to remember something, my word is the law. You know I can always escape. You are welcome to try. Griselda replied menacingly, making Naruto sigh in annoyance. Oh well, I might as well train in my free time. Naruto thought aloud. Nope, no training. Griselda interjected. Just tell me to die already. Naruto yelled at her in frustration. You fufu. -fu. Griselda giggled. But you are too young to die, Naruto. Ugh. Naruto screamed in frustration at the heavens. What had he done to receive such torture? In the meantime, I suggest you finish those books. Griselda said stopping Naruto from screaming. What books? The blonde boy asked in confusion. Those books. Griselda said pointing at the bookshelf behind her. Naruto brought up a shaking hand as he pointed at the bookshelf filled to the brim with books. You want me to read those books? Yup, all of them. Griselda replied with a smile. No way. Are you trying to kill me, lady? You fufu. -fu. It is just the beginning of your tour I mean your education Naruto. Griselda said laughing evilly while Naruto screamed for any deity to just save him from this demon. What an interesting predicament our blonde protagonist finds himself in. What if god like Naruto is death god in high school dxd, thanks for watching my video till the end if you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel, and leave a like if you guys need the next part, comment down, and thanks for watching the video and see you guys in the next video.